And they also ban Nautilus, okay? Now, already, you guys already know what I'm gonna say. They're red side, which means they have access to Draven. And Draven's not gonna get banned. And so, Zeri's also open, etc. Et if you're not gonna ban any of this stuff, just open Sivir. Also, Lucian doesn't need to be banned. The, the Lucian Nami thing is literally just fake news, man. You can open both of these. So, both of these bans... Right, both both the Sivir and the the uh, the Lucian bands don't really need to happen. Right, you could draft team compositions against Renata Glask, um, you know, just so that her ultimate Berserk has less value, etc. But um, for the most part, doesn't doesn't really matter uh, super much um, if they want to play around it. So already, I mean, two of the bands, whatever. Um, the Gwen ban is a little bit weird. Uh, because they're on blue, um, Ari, you guys already know what I think about Ari, and uh, Nautilus ban I think is really bad as well. So anyways, uh, they open with what? They open with Renekton B1. T1 responds with w w Callista Wukong. So this is already really bad for a lot of reasons. Um, Callista and Wukong are predicated both on getting ahead early. They're not. Bo they're both not scaling champions. They both really kind of peak in mid game unless the enemy team composition is really bad then wukong can have some more value uh on, on some things right but the problem is is that renekton likewise is predicated on early game advantage and mid game prowess and with all the buffs that renekton ended up getting durability update um you know you look at his patch history etc and a lot of other stuff he's actually very well positioned against both of these two champions and he's able to itemize against both really well as well so with this being considered Oddly, T1 blunder draft immediately on R1, R2. They hand it back over to Renekton. So it doesn't make any sense when the opponents pick Renekton that you then put yourselves on a clock and you make it so that you actually have to outscale the Renekton. Doesn't... Literally makes no sense. Now, Renekton could be a flex in mid and top. Um, so that is something that you could consider. But again, Renekton has one theme. He has one identity. And you already know exactly what it is. When you pick the Callista, you open yourself up to the Draven. I know that I made some sort of a comment uh, recently somewhere. I don't know if it was on Twitter or if it was on stream or something. But I've talked about Draven for obviously a long time um, in a lot of ways. Uh, when Callista top was a thing, I used to say Draven's very good against Callista even in top lane. Draven's also very good against Akshan, etc. Um, Draven right now exists inside of the meta, not because of any sort of the, the stuff going on around him, like in terms of like his buffs. His buffs were very nice, but they were much better for solo lane Draven than they were for bot lane Draven. I mean, bot lane Draven obviously still benefits from it. The reason that Draven exists right now is because he beats the trio of AD carries that are really popular. Zeri, Callista, and Sivir. He beats all three of them in laning phase. He still hits like a truck, and then he's also very good against a lot of the team compositions that tend to get drafted right now because all of them are early game, mid game centric. So Draven exists as a byproduct of the meta, not because Draven himself is super good, at least, you know, with people not flexing him. So, um, Don Juan goes Draven, and then Don Juan blunders with Braum. Now, the reason that Braum is a blunder is because Braum, sure, it's very good against Callista and it's very good against Wukong, but now you give T1 the ability to do uh, a counterpick support, and then in addition to counterpicking support, they can also pick their top lane on R4. So, you give them one line to mirror... Here, let me get Epic Pen open. Alright, so we give them... Was epic pen. Okay, so we give them one counter pick. Oh, let me change the color. We give them one counter pick, and then we give them the ability to match top lane. Because again, we don't really assume that Renekton's going to be flexed. And even if he is going to be flexed, it's likely that we can move the ch uh, champion that we picked top lane to go up against Renekton. So this is a huge blunder, right? Because now they get they get one counter, right? They get one counter, and then they get a match, right? Which is why would we do this? Why why would we why would we risk doing anything like that? Now you could choose Trundle here to vacuum answer, and if you vacuum answer oh sorry. Ooh. If you choose Trundle here to vacuum answer the Wukong, you're also doing something which is you're stifling any of the like very common counter picks to Renekton in top lane. You're reserving Trundle support as an option. Um, in addition to that, I guess you're reserving Trundle top lane, Renekton mid lane, and then an AP jungler in theory. Um, and you're, you're mostly stifling a lot of Renekton's counters, which are predominantly tanks or like, you know, mid game centric tanks like Sejuani and stuff like that. You're helping a little bit while reserving the counter pick. And then again, Trundle can still go support depending on what the end enemy picks. What this ends up doing is now you force T1 to either show their support, right, or show their top laner right now, 
and then they either have to show support mid or top on R4, thus giving you one counter pick. So you get you get plus one if you do it like this. So if you do it like this, you get plus one. And remember, Trundle is still a multi flex in theory. Also in theory, Draven should be a multi flex, but neither of them really are, right? So if you do this, uh, same thing happens. Now, additionally, Trundle's not the only champion that can do this. Poppy is already really well positioned inside of this draft. So you could also do Poppy because she's also able to go top lane. She's able to go mid lane, but very fringe matchups that, you know, honestly, it's going to be very rare. Uh, she can go jungle and she can also go support. Again, identical thing. Same school of thought, same reasoning. So there's other picks that they could also end up doing in a spot like this that would also be fine. Um, but predominantly, you're looking for like multi-flex champions that just respond to the Wukong because T1 already blundered draft so hard and you're currently ahead in the draft. So all that you really need to do is just make sure that you stay ahead in the draft and then everything's going to end up being fine. Um, but instead, they end up going Braum. Now, when they Braum at this point, now Dom Juan showing that they're all really short range. Braum, Renekton, and Draven are all weak to the same thing. They're all weak to terrain control, and they're all weak to range. The problem is, is that we are Swain, or we're Kalista, and we're Wukong, and, you know, obviously this feels really bad um, because th these champions are losing to the enemy three champions. But if we want to win the draft, we have to recognize that maybe it's still possible because Dom Juan just blundered. So because Don Juan just blundered, you will then end up uh, just mirroring the, the top laner uh, of, of the Renekton, and then you will choose most likely a support. So what we want to do is we want to obviously choose something that's going to end up winning versus Renekton or be fine against Renekton. Now, things like Malphite and whatnot, you want more intel on the jungler. So if you wanted to go something like a Malphite route, if you were entertaining that, um, or you were entertaining like, uh, I don't know, like uh, Shen or something like that, or you were entertaining Poppy or whatnot, you're going to want more intel. Um, now, Poppy becomes less viable on R3 because you can't flex her into jungle and you're not you're not flexing her, obviously, into support or something. Champions like, um, you know, ch champions like um, Shen or whatnot or Scion um, in, in spots like this, I think, like, tank Scion in a spot like this is probably going to end up being fine. Um, these things are, are likely going to end up being okay. If you do something like Tom Kench and you flex him top lane as well as support, you're still just losing bot lane, so that's not super great. So... You're in a little bit of a predicament, but again, you did it to yourself because of the way that you ended up drafting, and everything right now just feels really, really, really bad. Um, another thing that they could have... Uh, I actually forgot about this. They could have done on uh, this is they could have ended up choosing Gnosis um, because Callista can't actually go any other lane at this point. Any support that Callista picks is just losing. Um, there's no way for a bot lane to end up winning, and the Wukong and the Callista are really hurt by Gnosis, um, and then this allows you to continue to develop the draft, but obviously, yes, they didn't do that. So... At this point, um, you could do something like choose Orn, and I know what some people are thinking. The enemy has Braum, um, so choosing Orn is obviously griefing. Um, you could do something like you could choose Alawi, um, but then when you choose Alawi, you're really going to want some sort of like magic damage coming in uh, from center, um, and then this is obviously going to get a little bit weird. You could do things like pick Cho'Gath and try to flex it, uh, because he's obviously he can go tank top lane uh, against the Renekton, and then he could also go mid lane, but no one's really going to play him. Allow, he can also go mid lane, depending on certain mid lane enemy picks, such as like Silas or something. Um, it would be possible for him to end up going mid lane or other types of like, you know, sinful uh, mid lane picks that maybe the enemy would go for, like... Um, uh, Aurelia or something, but I mean, they're not going to obviously go for Aurelia, but I'm just giving you like a, a examples of other melees um, or something that it would be fine on. So you can do stuff like this, but no matter what, you're already in a really weird predicament because of the draft. So here you could just pick Orn and you could be happy with Orn. Um, what this ends up meaning is that the enemy might try to do something, obviously, against the Orn on B4-B5. Now on R4, the enemy is probably going to end up committing to some of their bans. We're about to head back into draft, so I'm going to stop this, uh, this talk. Um, they're going to commit some of their bans to the support pool. The support pool that the enemy is thinking about is likely just going to whiff because, uh, I mean, w what they're going to think or, you know, take as perceived bans is probably just not going to be super great. The enemy, again, is already short range, and it's hard engage, and things are... Things are already not looking super, super great. Um, but again, you have Callista, and so things uh, still do feel a little bit bad. But, uh, okay, we're about to get into draft. So you would likely end up just going support here on R4. Uh, so you find a Callista pairing that is fine uh, against, you know, uh, the, the, the Draven and the Braum. 
and then you you know you play from you play from that point i guess so let's say that t1 still wants to go a mumu right let's say that they want to go a mumu and they want to try to go even because a mumu is really good against uh the hard engage well now some of the longer range champions or some of the anti-engage champions i mean I, I guess they could still go morgana and they could go jungle and then obviously this feels really bad so now your orn uh, your Orn is working against Morgana Black Shield and Braum Ultimate, so now it feels bad. And also, you gave them uh, the Amumu, so this feels really bad. Um, so if you do if you do the Amumu, then you would need a Morgana ban uh, probably to end up being present if you entertain that like uh, Morgana Jungle is a thing. If you don't end up doing that in uh, the drafts, what they ended up doing is they banned Talia and they banned Trundle, but it's already too late to ban uh, Talia and Trundle. Also, likewise, uh, T1 ended up picking a Amumu here instead of Orn, so it was not super great but anyways uh for, for sake of the for sake of the draft because we're about to get back into the draft we'll we'll just do this and then uh dom one ended up banning azir which is uh, a, a terrain control champion that also does have range and again because t1 has counter pick um it's not like uh blue side can layer them um with longer range and then they banned atrox um who is flourishes in mid-range versus mid-range, but I would say that uh, Renekton, with the way the current comps are, is actually better because Renekton's two teammates are better than what Atrox's three teammates would end up being. Um, so this is how it ended up going, and then on this, uh, what ended up happening? Um, so in, in this spot is where uh, Silas was picked, right? Oh, no, this is... Um, this is... Oh, wait. Oh, fuck. This is game two, not game three. Um, but anyways, I'll, I'll get back to it. I'll get back to it. All right. So, in game two, like where we were saying, they end up picking Silas here. Now, if you, you know, you guys are just joining us, we talked about this right before this game started, okay? So, when they end up picking Silas, again, it's the same problem. They're all engaging into Braum, Draven, and Renekton, which doesn't make any sense. Silas, also, if he has to engage in fight versus these, he's going to have to go Zanya second, he doesn't have a choice. When Silas ends up going Zanya second, it ends up stunting his build. I talk about this with junglers, mid laners, everyone all the time, in that when you build Zanya second, it feels really bad. The reason that building Zanya second feels really bad is because while you're building into Zanya's, what ends up happening is you get Fiendish, right? So you get Fiendish, so you get uh, AP, uh, CDR, right? And then you get Stopwatch, right? Stasis. Now, Typically, you do not, I mean, you don't get Seekers, right? You don't get Seekers Arm Guard. So what does completing Zanya's really end up doing? What, what does getting Zanya's Hourglass, um, you know, really end up doing? Well, by completing Zanya's Hourglass, you gain access to uh, an additional 30 AP, right? And 45 armor, right? So when you, when you complete, um, when you complete, you get 30 AP and 45 armor. These stats are not super valuable, especially not for the reasons that, like, he's, uh, or that, you know, while, while you're building into it, um, or, like, ju just to have as a standalone. The Zanya's active is really good, so when you have it the first time with Stopwatch at one items and you're building into it, the Stopwatch that one time is really good, then you finish it and you're stuck with it. You keep having the stasis, but the stats that you actually get for the remainder of the next 10-12 minutes is really bad because you're stuck with the extra 30 AP and then you were typically 10-12 to 12 minutes off of your next item. So. Take, for instance, what happens if you build, you know, uh, let's say that you build Everfrost and then you build Demonic Embrace, right? Or something like this. Now, as you're building into Zanyas, you get access to that Fiendish, right? So you're missing, you're missing minus 30 AP and you're missing minus 45 armor. But while you have the Fiendish and then while you have the Stopwatch, by the time you use the Stopwatch, there's not that much downtime between you completing Zanya's as third item and when you use the stopwatch in most cases. Typically, it's only going to be a couple of minutes because normally you sit on the stopwatch for a really exact moment. So the 10 to 12 minutes that would normally be the third item, during that 10 to 12 minutes, you buy the stopwatch at some point and you buy the Fiendish Codex. Then there's only usually a couple of minutes remaining. So the downtime is very different and that's why curving into Zanya's third is a lot better because... While you're curving into it, you effectively have the item. You don't have the 45 armor, you're missing 30 AP, but when we're talking about two and a half items, that's not really, like, you would, you would rather be missing 30 AP and 45 armor than be missing the active of Demonic Embrace and, uh, you know, everything that comes with it. 
right or something so that's why um when, when you're when you have to build uh zanya second here it's bad now some people might try to claim that it's fine to build zanya second here because there's so much physical damage on the enemy team you could say that that's true but again you don't know what silas is going into yet and renekton technically could still be flexed to fight silas which is really bad and in the event that this ends up happening, again, because you don't know what you're going into yet, that Zanya's, while it might have value right now against Renekton and Draven, it's still not insane value, especially not if Draven ends up just going tanky and durable. He doesn't really care that you're a little bit more tanky because you're not killing him anyway if he has Shield Bow and Bloodthirster. Likewise, Renekton, because you don't have Grievous Wounds and no one on your team has Grievous Wounds, Renekton doesn't really care that he has to hit you a little bit more, and Renekton doesn't really care about that, you know, the, the 45 armor being there or not in, in most cases cases in mid-game team fights. So the Silas is really weird. What ends up happening is Duck, um, Dom Juan end up now going Poppy, uh, which is very well positioned. L look at what she murders. She murders all of these champions. And then they go the LeBlanc, which obviously I'm not a very big fan of. Um, reason that I'm not a very big fan of the LeBlanc is because there is just point and click snare on the enemy team in the form of the Amumu. It has a really good matchup into the Silas and it can definitely bully him. It can kill him, um, especially if uh, she ends up getting ahead. She can get lane priority and stuff. Azir is banned, so you don't have that obviously as an option. But what you could end up doing is you notice that the enemy team is still very, very short range. Your Baron taking potential is still not really the greatest, especially not with Poppy. So what if we choose a near identical champion that is still really good in laning phase, has really good neutral control, and scales a lot better than LeBlanc without being susceptible as much to the point and click snare on the side of T1 or just being picked off in general? Well, what can we do if, if we want to do something like that? Well, you can actually just take Corky, or alternatively, you could just take Cassiopeia. Both of these two champions would be a lot better. Now, the two things that these champions are weak to would be long-range champions, you know, things that can control terrain and stuff like that. So if GP ends up coming in, it's a little bit annoying, but at the end of the day, you're not super bad because Gangplank wants to go back to the time where Riot killed him and he wasn't available to be picked by anyone. Riot wants to go back to that time, or Gangplank wants to go back to that time because he absolutely hates the draft. So that would be an option for Dom Juan if they still wanted to take the Poppy that's really good against four of these champions, and then they want a, a champion that's just better than LeBlanc in a lot of cases. Another champion that is also really good and he's going to guaranteed be able to scale up would be something like Kossadin. But the thing with Kossadin that makes things a little bit weird is that now you kind of want your Poppy to be a little bit lower economy and the Silas is going to have a little bit more control than he otherwise would, but still you're going to be really valuable at level 6. You're going to be strong even in the you know the mid-game fights and whatnot. And then si or, or Kossadin could even go like tank Kossadin or something if you really wanted to, to further hurt the Callista and the Wukong or something. You could do like a bruiser type of Kossadin. Um Now, other options that Damwon would have when the Silas is picked here, because we know that, again, uh, Silas is not uh, going to go top lane or something, um, is... Dom Juan could move the Renekton to, you know, match the Silas inside of mid lane, and they could choose a different top laner if they wanted to at this point. Now, some of the blind top laners that they might like to pick um, aren't maybe the best. Um, obviously, the enemy team, uh, Atrox, is actually banned, but if they didn't ban Atrox, uh, maybe they could have picked it, because I don't think that they would actually mind fighting against Atrox um, in all seriousness. I, I don't think it would be of uh, the utmost concern. Um, so they're looking for other like blind top laners or something that they would like picking that isn't like an Orn um, or like a Malphite or something like that. Um, they could go with Gangplank if they wanted to, and then they could choose an AP jungler. Alternatively, they could still choose an AP jungler. They could go for Fiddlesticks um, or something, which ruins and destroys this enemy team composition. Um, and if they go for Fiddlesticks, they need to make sure that they still have mid prio. Now again, Renekton can still flex uh, mid against the Silas and whatnot, or you could just take Lowy, who has a Omega Kek W absolutely broken laning phase into the Silas, and there's nothing that he can really do, and you are going to be having five tentacles every single team fight in mid-game. Kalista's going to run for the fucking hills. You have siege potential, you have massive counter engage, you have massive engage, and then with fiddlesticks and everything, you have really good Baron taking, you have really good uh, zone control with uh, the Alawi, and then what are they going to pick I guess at this point, um, they might try to move the Silas top lane and, you know, they have to choose a champion that can both, again, fight the Alawi. 
They have it has to be able to fight the Alawi and the Renekton. So they have to choose a champion that can fight both Alawi and Renekton in mid lane if they want to try to move Silas top lane. But again, Alawi would just follow him, and so the champion would be fighting against Renekton um, in most cases. Now again, uh, it doesn't have to be Fiddle. I mean, there, there's an abundance of champions, like I said, right? Um, now. It, the the thing with Shivana, Shivana might look good here because you have likely what is going to be a winning top lane or something. Uh, you have a winning bot lane uh, as it stands, and then Alawi is just dumpstering uh, Silas, and then Shivana's damage is, is completely fine. So you can actually stack dragons. The problem with this is that you still don't know with the utmost certainty that Renekton um, is going to super hard win um, top lane or something. Now, some of the champions that might just beat on Renekton or actually manage to beat him are likely going to be really bad into a Lowy. So I mean I guess you could you could you could entertain something like that. Um, other champions that maybe would be really funny would be like Tarek Jungle, who has an absolutely giga insane uh, clear speed inside of the jungle, uh, completely fine into Udir uh, or uh, Wukong or something. Udir would be another jungler that uh, you could end up picking. Uh, they could end up taking Udir, and that would also be really fine. But the problem is, is that the Silas opens up way too many options for Damwon in the draft phase, and it just causes T1 to be losing. As played, what ends up happening is, again, uh, they choose Poppy, and then they, uh, then they choose LeBlanc. So now you know that you're up against Poppy, and you're up against uh, Renekton, and they have a LeBlanc. You have a Silas and whatnot. Now, at this point, honestly... I think that you probably just end up going, I mean, I, I think that you, yeah, I, I, I think that you just end up going, you either accept your fate and you try to go like Ornn or something, but that's not super good. Um, Malphite is fine in a spot like this. I think Malphite would actually be somewhat okay. Um, you can't, I can't suggest things like in my right mind, like uh, Urgot and whatnot. Just because I don't think that it's very viable that you get the fear beyond death. Now, you might notice that Draven is isolated and LeBlanc are isolated as primary carries, and that without either one of them inside of a fight, things might be a little bit weird. So in that regard, maybe this is unironically a Mordekaiser spot. The problem with the Mordekaiser is now you have three AP champions, and if the enemy does eventually get to magic resistance or QSS or something like that, um, it's going to feel really bad just because of how much it hurts um, your Mordekaiser. Another thing that you could maybe try to end up doing uh, w w would be like what? Um, I mean, you could you could try to counter um, you could try to, to counter in mid lane or something. Uh, you could maybe do something like Tristana, but Tristana is not super great because again, their team composition uh, it feels really bad. Um, they could try to pivot out of everything. They could try to go Corky, and then it's LeBlanc versus Corky, and that's just something that you might have to accept. And if you end up doing this, then your Silas gets countered, and that sucks too. So as played, T1 ends up picking Nar. Now, the problem with picking Gnar is that while it does vacuum answer the Renekton, there's still so many problems that are present elsewhere. So when the final team compositions end up sculpting up, yes, you have the Gnar against the Renekton and stuff, but Renekton has gotten a lot of changes. And then you have a Gnar that is still doing the same thing as your Wukong, your Amumu, and your Silas. It's diving in. Even though the LeBlanc is really bad, the consistency and the way that mid and bot lane should go, because of the dynamics of the matchup, Draven has autonomy no matter what, and the opponent doesn't really have a say in that. What this ends up meaning is that your ability to get slightly ahead in top lane doesn't convert to anything, and Renekton holistically should be pretty safe across most scenarios. There's no way to actually like bully him or dive him or do anything like that. On the flip side, though, your Gnar is in a bit of a predicament because of the mid and the jungle matchup, assuming that the lanes play out the way that it does. Now is the argument that T1 should be able to go even in the lanes, even though Dom Juan is winning the lanes. Yes, they should be able to go even. Silas should be able to fall behind in CS, lose uh, you know, a little bit of stuff, and be fine. Nar should be able to go even and get ahead. Callista should be able to just go down a little bit of CS to Draven. The predicament that we're in is that what this means is that we surrender dragons to Dom Juan. If we're surrendering dragons to Dom Juan and we're surrendering some early gold, maybe losing turret plates, maybe losing a herald, what is the trade-off in exchange for doing that? What is the trade-off in exchange for playing the lanes with losing lanes to go even against T1's draft. There's no trade-off because T1 has better pick, they have better scaling, they have better forms of, like, engage. Uh, I, I would say that they also have better Baron taking potential, they have better neutral objective potential, and there's no real way to actually kill Draven in fights. Now, obviously in this game, we saw that Duck Dom tried his best to die three times in 120 seconds. And if not for that, and had they just gotten the dragon, this would have looked like game three. So now let's bring, uh, brings me to the point of game three. All right. So the, the, this, this is the difference in the draft. Okay. So this is game two. 
So what ends up happening, in, or sorry, this is game. This is uh, this is game three. So T1 was doing a salty run back. Oops, sorry. Wait. Don one ban uh, Silas and Azir instead. So okay, this is game number three. So T1's bans are still the same, and we've already talked about um, the bans when we when we talked about game two's bans. Okay. So when we when we talk about game two's bans, and we talk about stuff that's going on there. Oh. Okay. And then obviously what ends up happening here is Damwon uh, decide that Silas was problematic for them in that last game, even though it had nothing to do with Silas that was being problematic. And then Damwon also bans an Azir. Now, again, we, we already talked about Azir and how Azir can slot in versus the, the, the Draven, Renekton, and Brahm and stuff, okay? So, oh yeah, let me, let me move Cam and let me, let me move some other stuff. Um, let me get out of studio mode. Let me uh, turn this off. Okay. And then, okay, cool. All right. So let's move Cam now. All right. So now we're talking about this. Okay. So what T1 ends up doing here is they go for Lissandra on R4. Now, the Lissandra on R4 seems really weird because why? Well, Lissandra loses to Death Ball. Lissandra's very weak versus Death Ball. This team composition is already a very uber hard engage. And it's they they're not choosing to pivot out of it when they end up going Lissandra. Um, the scary thing about Lissandra is Lissandra opens up stuff like Corky getting picked um, on R four. Like Corky Corky would definitely be an option that they could end up going for. Um, and if it ends up being Corky, then like now things are just getting very set up for for Draven Corky to just like kite backwards. And Brahm and Renekton are definitely going to be a serviceable enough um, front line for nothing to really happen. And I think it's going to be very unreliable for Lissandra to do anything. I think even in a situation like this, I really don't like Victor as a champion, but I think it's really hard to deny that Victor would be really good in a spot like this, and that what is Lissandra really going to do? Another option would be to choose an AP jungler against Wukong, because he has a lot of bad matchups into AP junglers. Um, so you would get access... If, so if you go like Tristana mid lane, who's received a lot of buffs, by the way, and then you do, again, we talked about this in, in game two, you do Karthus, you do Fiddlesticks, you could even do Evelyn at this point, right? Um, but again, you don't know what's going to happen to your Renekton. Now, Lissandra doesn't have any flex potency. Uh, Wukong is never going to go top lane or anything like that. I think that you could even do something um, in a spot like this where you could like choose Akshan if you want to be like really lane bully in mid. And then again, the AP junglers uh, would end up being very serviceable and they would, they, would, they would be a very good pick. So you have all of these options. So this is why I think that the, the Lissandra pick just literally makes no sense whatsoever. I don't even know why it's coming out. I don't know what it's supposed to be preemptive for. Uh, I, I don't understand like what they're trying to do. If you want a preemptive mid laner, well, I, T1 are just in a doomed situation, right? You can't even like Swain right here because again, then they uh, get uh, they pivot, Don Juan pivots to um, disengage, poke, scaling stuff, and then you don't have a response on R5. And Swain's obviously not going top lane. So the Lissandra is also another really bad problem uh, where there's just, there's way too many champions that exist that are going to be way too good against her. Uh, I mean, you could, you could even do something like Cassiopeia, just like against the Silas or something. And it's an identical situation that we talked about in game number two. So there's so many options. And this is all really, really problematic. Now, I don't think that they can do Enchanter's mid lane in a spot like this. I don't think that, you know, you'd want to Ivern or something. And the reason that I don't think that you'd want to Ivern is because I think if you're going to end up Iverning and you're going to do something like Shivana, now you're, yes, now this, this would be a Dragon Soul comp, right? Because you have the bot lane matchup that you want. You have Ivern, you have Shivana, you're going to get the Dragons. There is no way that T1 are contesting you early. There's no way anything's happening in mid lane. There's no way that... You know, anyone on this team is going to burst through uh, Ivern, uh, his shields on any of the carries. Ivern's going to be able to go Moonstone. He's going to be able to get Mikhail's. It's going to have insane value against Amumu and Lissandra in mid game, and everything's going to be problematic. This is an option, but I don't think it's the best option. Uh, you know, if, if you want to, if you want to talk about stuff like this, I mean, you can definitely do Udir for mixed damage. I'm staying away from something like Zin Zhao here, and then obviously Gwen is banned. So if you were going to do an Ivern type thing, then I think that you'd obviously want access to Gwen. Um, 
um, as you know, as a, as a jungle champion that could do really well. Now with Ivern, you're not going to do stuff like Karthus, Fiddle, Eve, or any any of these AP jungler champions. But I, I just wanted to mention it as a possibility because with the way that the draft is right now, there's no way for T1 to contest dragons. And then because of how much less gold Shivana and Ivern need, and because it's a given the way that the bot lane will end up going in terms of um, you know, dynamics and the way that Draven will curve inside of this game and the way that Draven's already set up, and you have Braum, you have Ivern, and Ivern's items cost so much less than the opponent's, it just makes it so that not only is Damwon getting early dragons, their champions also require less time in the game in order to reach their item break points. So everything's just going bad for T1 um, if something like that would end up happening. So these are all definitely possibilities that they could go for. Now, uh, Damwon in game actually went for a really cool uh, thing and it was the thing that we talked about in the game 2 thing which is the Morgana and now Morgana has insane value you guys might remember when I talked about Morgana in the previous draft and I said the, the type of problems that um, like an Ornn pick on R4 could end up doing um, if Morgana ended up being picked or something so in, in this game I think I think the Morgana was really good I think all in all it's very good it's well matched up into Wukong and it didn't look like uh, Canyon actually was familiar with some of Morg's clears, but I, I don't think it, it matters um, in that game. And then the Swain is very well positioned because right now it's very hard for anyone on this team composition to actually get uh, Grievous Wounds. The only person that you're going to have get Grievous Wounds is you're either going to have a Mumugo AP and then he's going to build an Oblivion Orb and you're going to Prage um, that he engages onto Swain, he stuns him, and then he has his W, he keeps applying it. You're either going to do that with a Mumu or it's going to be Wukong having to build Kempunk sword and then if wukong has to bring old kempunk sword he's going to now have to stay on top of swain and keep applying it which makes things more problematic but the thing that's really good about swain is again t1's team composition only has one direction there's only one direction for this t1 team composition it is to literally go in do they have a better mid lane? No. Do they have a better bot lane? No. Can T1's champions go even in both mid and bot lane? Yes. Just like most lanes, you can fight as professional players to go even. What's the trade-off for going even? Do we outscale? No, we don't outscale. Are, are, do we have pick? No, we don't have pick because they have the Morgana Black Shield, they have Braum. Do we have any sort of disengage? Yes, but our disengage is all really bad because it then makes us unable to fight. They have like... You know they have Callista Pokeball. They have, uh, they 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 have a clone on Wukong against uh, Morgana. Do we have good objective taking uh, potential? No, they don't have good objective taking potential because their their damage right now is actually relatively low because again, Amumu is a support or something, so it's not like he's burning anything with uh, any of a, a demonic embrace and things of this nature. So things are looking really rough. So the, the Lissandra just doesn't make any sense. It's not doing anything. I don't know why it's preemptive. It has so many. Things that allow the enemy to set up B4, B5, and just smack it really, really, really hard. So it's just a losing pick. It's always a losing pick. It's a bad pick. There's nothing that can bail you out on R5. Because again, you need a champion that can go into top lane against Reactive and have enough transformative value against these champions that it ends up being worth it. You're not going to do something like, you're not going to pick Gangplank here and, you know, end up just doing nothing in laning phase and then coming online in mid-late game in order to gain access to terrain control and more scaling. Because if this was your mindset, if you're willing to do this, then you shouldn't be wanting to pick R1, R2, R3, and this is not a, a, a winning uh, thing anyway. You also can't choose any of, like, the bruisers or something. You can't you can't choose, like, other bruisery champions to fight against Renekton because then you're getting thematically answered by the Draven, the Braum, the Morgana, and the Swain. So Dom1 right now, they have pick, right? Via the, they, they have pick with, with Braum if they want it, Flash, you know, stun Renekton if they want it, etc. Uh, they have Morgana Q, which is on a very short cooldown. They can just keep throwing it out. They have they have a very good mid lane, very good bot lane. It is assumed, assuming that everything goes normally in lane, that they will get ahead early. The autonomy is on them. They have full knowledge of the matchups and stuff. It's very limited what T1 can do. So on R5, what do you even pick? You've lost your access to things like Orin and stuff because now, now there's a lot for him to fight, but again, it's also counterintuitive. If you choose a tank or something, um, some of your, none of the tanks are going to be able to itemize for both uh, Renekton and be able to itemize uh, against Morgana. So there's that stuff going on there. You're going to need champions that need Mercury Treads because of the amount of magic on the enemy team as well as everything else that's going on 
down because Swain's going to have access to Mandate Rylize as one of his builds, or depending on how the game's curving, Swain gets access to Moonstone because if Swain's not doing anything, but Renekton's really ahead, or Draven's really ahead, Morgana's really ahead, and they're dealing damage, and they're getting all the early dragons, all Swain needs to do is not die in fights. And what's the best way for him not to die in fights? So you just get Moonstone because it's so cheap. And then because you get Moonstone, and then you can curve into even cheaper items, your ability to come online faster would be greater, it would be quicker with that build than with a more expensive build. And if you're already winning in the game elsewhere, then you don't need to come online uh, and deal a lot of damage. You just need to suffocate your opponent's options. You're already ahead, win by one. That's all that you have to do. So, Lissandra, really, really bad in a lot of ways. Um, honestly, R5 is just doomed. I I at that point, when you get to the R5, you, you have a lot of magic damage, you have a Moomoo and Liss, um, you're forced to pick a physical damage champion, and even if you do stuff like you pick Urgot or something, again, they just have so many beefy champions that it's really hard. You could maybe try to Prage and what, do Tank Rise or something, but again, now you don't really have a lot of damage if you do something like Tank Rise and you try to take him top lane. Also, I would say that he's very susceptible. You can't Mordekaiser and try to like take out Swain or Draven from the fight. That's not really an option either. And so what are what is really even your options? I mean, honestly, I think from that point, I think when when there is uh when there is Morgana and Swain is also there as well, I think you just need to pray. I really do think that you just need to pray and you need to try to like cheese or something. And that's just how bad the draft is. So even though I don't think that champions like this, well, Akshon actually I do think is viable, um, but that he's just never picked. Even though, you know, I, I would hate suggesting something like this, I do think that you, you have to go for something like this and you have to pray. And then obviously the enemy team should know that and they should be able to play around it. So I think that you're, you're left, uh, you know, looking towards uh, Akshon as like a, an option in top lane. Um, let me think what else. I think that like maybe trying to go uh, Rost top lane um, would be something else. But then, I mean, again, you're Rost and you're running into the opponents and it feels really bad. Um, the one upside is that Rost isn't really, I mean... It's going to be very awkward for anyone here to get Grievous Wounds uh, unless, like, uh, I mean, I guess if Swain go, if, if if you went raw, actually, no, I'm sorry. If you went Rost and then Renekton or Botlane or Morgana got ahead and Swain went Moonstone and then he went Chemtech Putrefire, you're screwed rude in fights if there's something like that happened so i don't think that you're gonna rust you're not gonna do a lowey to counter the renekton because it's really bad against the swain and the morgana and you can just get picked and then everything else um i mean if you grogus this is so much magic damage black shield has more value again everything just feels really bad at this point so really what are your options so i think there's probably only like one option which is something like kale um and prey you're going you're gonna to have to go Kale, and you're going to have to Prey. And I think, I think that's literally the only thing that you can hope to do is Kale and Prey. So you've got Kale, you have Akshan, and Prey. And I cannot think of anything else off the top of my head that would be better than Kale and Praying. Or Kale, Kale or Akshan and Praying. Um, I do not think that doing something like Tristana top lane uh, would be of much value. Again, you're limited on options for some of the champions just because of the damage spread on your team right now and what's already happening to you in mid and, uh, mid and uh, bot lane. I don't think that you can send uh, Lissandra top lane and that it achieves much value because Swain can just follow her and stuff. So everything here is really bad. Rumble doesn't work again because we've already we've already assessed magic damage champions aren't super um, aren't super great. Um, someone in chat is saying Ezreal. I think this is the same school of thought as uh, well. I mean, this is a way to play around Domwon, right? You you gain access to a poke champion that scales. Um, I mean, I, I guess right. Uh, this would be a variation of like poke that could maybe take over the game because he's so nimble. The enemies would actually have a hard time to lock him down. If Renekton never has flash, you're never killing Ezreal. That would be an option, I guess, if you go Ezreal top lane. Um, and then because of his damage type and stuff, he's not, you know, he's not... One of the things that I've always said about, like, Karthus is that Karthus is very misunderstood as a jungler or even Fiddlesticks. Fiddlesticks less so, actually. Let me just use Karthus as the example. A lot of people think that when you have Karthus, you can't have any other magic damage dealers on the team, and that's not true. You just simply need to pick champions that do induce magic resistance. Champions that don't induce magic resistance that also deal, you know, good magic uh, or a good amount of magic. Champions like Yone, 
champions like um you know uh what, what am i what am i blanking on what am i blanking on what am i blanking corky uh corky was like probably the, the the bread and butter version of that corky deals magic but you don't build magic resistance against corky you're stupid you're not gonna build banshees versus corky you're not gonna you know you're not gonna i mean maybe you get a uh, force of nature or something like that but uh, realistically, it's, it's not super good. Um, someone else in chat right now is recommending Nico. Um, obviously, it would have to be AD Nico. I think that she can really bully and put Renekton under a lot of pressure. But then once we get into mid game, I think that she would have less value than, say, Ezreal. Um, but I do think that Nico, uh, similarly, is much, uh, much so like Akshan. The cool thing about Nico is that her W. Uh, she can actually, um, so a lot of people don't know this about Nico. Um, it, it's, it's a mechanic about Nico. It's probably only going to be passable on Korean server or LAN. Um, you know, your ping needs to be really low. But Nico can W in response to a lot of things, including Renekton's stun, I believe, un unless I'm wrong on this. And she can dodge it. And then obviously with her W, she can stop Morgana stuff very, very akin to Wukong clone. So you could go for Nico. And if you go for Nico and you exert tons of pressure onto Renekton, that is not a lane Renekton can just be left on an island. That is not a lane um, that he can, again, just be left alone. Um, very much so like Akshan. You can't, you can't leave Renekton alone against either Akshan or Nico. And so in this regard, you can know... Yeah, Morgana's probably going to end up top lane. And so that might reduce a little bit of pressure, and that's, a, that's an avenue that you could go for. So Akshan and Nico and Ezreal, well, Ezreal less so than Akshan and Nico. I think Ezreal is like in the middle of the Kale spectrum. So like if you, if you have Kale, if you have Kale on one side, okay? So if you have Kale on one side and then on the other side you have, uh, you know, you have, oh, you guys can't see it when I write it up there, sorry. Uh, so if you have Kale on one side, of the spectrum, and then you have uh, Akshan and you have uh, Nico, right? Um, Ezreal, I think, would be somewhere in the middle. He's not going to exert, I think, the same amount of threat as, say, an Akshan or a Nico would. He definitely exerts a lot of threat, but I don't think it's to the same extent um, as Nico and Akshan. Ezreal does have survivability, just like these two, but he also has the insurance of being the, uh, the champion that's very hard for these champions to hold, but I wouldn't say that he's the highest, uh, you know, carry threat late like Kale would be. So I, I feel like we're left with four options on R5. Um, that would be the way that I, I, I deduce that. So obviously T1 is not going to ever pick any of these champions. Now inside of the game, oh, sorry. Uh, inside of the game, when we actually went into the game, remember how they lost game two? It's very unnatural. And, you know, we, we go through the game. Let me, uh, let me make my cam a little bit smaller for this part, right? We'll go into the game, and we'll go through everything. Now, in game number two, Gumiyushi got uh, kills gifted over early. And you guys can just see the, the natural curve of stuff. And I understand that some people uh, would accuse me of being results-based because the previous game had different outcomes, right, than this game in the early stages of the game with uh, a similar bot lane and other stuff. Um, this is not result... What, what I'm trying to explain to you is, while it might sound like it's results-based analysis and that uh, Damwon is just winning very early on, what I'm trying to do is I'm imploring you to ask yourself the question, what is most likely to happen in these two lanes if both players want it to? Now, what I mean by both players want it to is who has autonomy in the lane? That's the first question. Who has autonomy in the lanes? So first you have to decide who, well, who has it? Okay, so if player A has autonomy and player B does not, that means player A gets to decide how a lot of things are going to go. Player A then has to recognize that player B has a jungle or there's a certain matchup and stuff, and that there's probably chances that player B can play in a way to try to go 50-50. Now, if player B plays to go 50-50, what does that grant them? So then you, you, know, you fast forward and you ask yourself the question, what does it grant if... Callista and Amumu just go down 10 CS. What does it grant if Lissandra goes down 10 CS? What does it grant if Atrox just goes even or something? What are the things that's granted? And we've already run through the draft and we've determined that there's not enough upside to just go 50-50, which now means that T1's comp, which is already behind and lacks autonomy, needs to become the beatdown. Don Juan being professional players, and obviously Canyon as a professional jungler understanding this, understands that his lanes have autonomy from the get-go and that they are in control of what will end up happening, which means that all he needs to do is deflect and win by one. This is literally like the rabbit in the turtle race, right? I really love the quote, win by one. Win by one is mostly just... Um, if an AI or a robot was fighting you or something, as soon as it gets 
0.1% of an advantage, if that means that it'll finish the race first, all it needs to do is just ensure that you can never catch up. You will not pass that 0.1%. It doesn't need to exert any more force. It doesn't need to try to get to 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, or 2%, 3%. It doesn't need to do that. All it needs to do is stop any chance, any possibility, any out of yours from being able to come online. This is also seen in uh, a different game, which is poker, um, where you know you ask a regular person, maybe your parents or something, if you're not familiar with poker, but maybe they are because they're from a different generation. You ask your parents that one player has ace-king and one player has ace-queen. Uh, what does the player who have uh, ace-queen, what does he need? The, your parents or you know yourself, you'll say, oh, well, I need a queen, right? And then you ask the question, what does the ace-king player uh, want? Because if you're unfamiliar with poker, there's pairings, there's card pairings. King is greater than queen, queen's greater than jack, jack's greater than 10, 10's greater than nine, and so on. And then ace is obviously the highest. Now, both of these uh, uh, parties uh, both have an ace, okay? So they're even there. But the king's ahead of the queen. Now, we've already established that the queen needs a queen in order to get ahead of the king so that they can make a pair. What does the king need? A lot of people, especially those who are emotional, and especially those who maybe like play a lot, but they don't really think about this too critically, they will say that they want a king. Because when a king comes, what ends up happening is, what are the odds now that your opponent doesn't just get one queen, but they get two queens? It's astronomically low. There is three queens in the entire deck. There's three queens in the whole deck. So what are the odds that this ends up happening? It's so low. It is so low. It's not going to happen, right? If, if the king drops, right? I mean, it happens once in a blue moon. The same way that sometimes comebacks happen in League of Legends, 10,000 gold advantage, right? And all this other stuff. So it's very, very, very low. So the person that has ace king wants a king, but does he need a king? That, that, that's all that actually matters. Does he need a king? What happens if the board runs out 2-3, jack, and then 9, and then 7? Or 4, whatever, whatever you want to call this, right? Okay, 4 or 9, I know my handwriting is straight. What happens uh, in this instance? Who wins? The king. The king wins, because the king's already ahead. He doesn't need a king to win. That would just make him feel better. That would, if you're just a recreational player at the casino, you're playing at home with your friends, your parents are playing at home with their friends, it'd make them feel better. Because there's an anxiety before all the cards have come out, right? The fear of the unknown. Like, thinking that you can always get ganked by a jungler because you're bronze or silver, right? But the jungler has clear paths. And he has to do those clear paths without there being an enormous amount of risk. Which is why we make fun of players who do one camp and then gank, right? Or they do two camps and then gank and it fails, right? Because the likelihood that it'll work. So, the king doesn't need a king. That's just emotional. It makes them feel good. Same way that players don't need cookies to win lane. It just makes them feel good. It makes them feel better because they're safer in the event that they make a really big mistake. They like having at the back of their mind that they have that HP or that mana. But does that mean that they're actually playing with the intention of playing to the best of their ability if they have full knowledge of things and they understand the jungler dynamic and all this other stuff, right? So we can just have lots of sequences like uh, this end up unfolding. So, ace-king versus ace-queen. So, uh, oops, sorry. So, we, d we just finished talking about that. So now, Canyon understands this. Canyon understands that his team composition is ace-king and T1's is ace-queen. His entire idea is not about what he wants to do. Would he like to... What, now, interestingly enough, we saw him do it in this game. Would Canyon like to have done... Raptors and red at the same exact time on Morgana? Yeah, why not? I mean, obviously you would like to do that. The problem is, is that that comes with an inherent amount of risk. You get very low on HP, and if you're not standing in the right spot, then the camps can reset. Interestingly enough, it seems like Canyon actually understood that. Now, I'll show you guys how we know that Canyon seems to understand this. Okay, let's go backwards. And it also, it shows you that owner understands on a subconscious or conscious level, it doesn't matter, that he is ace queen. He understands that he's ace queen. So what does owner do? Owner does his red, owner does his wraiths, and then owner goes to his blue? Or no, he goes to his gromp? He goes to his gromp, right? He gets level three. What does owner do? Owner knows he's ace queen. 
if the board runs out five cards, he'll lose because his team composition needs to get ahead to win. They need aid in the lanes because of the natural autonomy that the lanes have. So owner tries to flip. He, try, he tries to do something. Canyon, as the ace king person in, in this example, could understand that his laners are already winning and he doesn't need to emotionally get further ahead, right? He would love to clear Raptors and Red probably same time, but again, it comes with an inherent amount of risk. Let's say that if they play these two games out 100 times, let's say that, you know, Canyon can do that clear, you know, with whatever openings happen. Let's, let's say arbitrary number. Let's say he can do it 80% of the time. He can, do, he can do both camps same time, right? There's still a 20% instance where something goes wrong or he can't do it because of something that happened level one uh, or level two in one of the lanes or something like that, right? There's still the 20%. Of this 20%, there is a scenario where literally this exact thing happens. Owner does his three camps, and he goes to invade the red. And Canyon is doing the golems. If Canyon was trying to do both camps at the same time, Owner would be able to invade this, stop it. He has the smite, obviously, etc. He'd be able to kill Canyon. Okay, Canyon can deduce that this is a possibility. He can simulate that, like in his head, this is a possibility, and he can make the decision to forego the greedier line why can he forego the greedier line because he's ace king and the opponent is ace queen he's already ahead he doesn't need to take a line that will increase the chances of him getting a king okay you can take this example that i just gave because this is just a game theory thing right it applies to literally all games tcgs rts's mobas literally everything this is just this is just game theory Okay, and you can extend this to other examples of League of Legends. When you extend it to other examples of League of Legends, you begin talking about fundamental aspects of strategy that pertain to the game and fundamental ideas of evaluating who's the beatdown, who's not the beatdown, etc., and then making decisions against the range of the opponents. What is Wukong's range in this game? So imagine there is a spectrum. Okay, Wukong has a spectrum. He can full clear. He can five camp, he can four camp, he can uh, four camp gank and then go back to clear. He can five camp gank, he can six camp gank. He can, he can do all these things. And then Wukong can do the three camp into cheese. He can do red buff into cheese. He can do two camp into cheese or stuff. He can do uh, three camp into, you know, top gank or bot gank or something like that, etc. And as Dom Juan and as professional players, you need to determine what is your opponent's range not just based on the player, but also based on the champion that he's playing. And now Morgana, we can now make an imaginary, like, uh, we, can, we can make a different uh, range below here. Morgana can then go through and be like, well, he can't do that because I'll just do this. My teammates will do this. He can't do this because it's worse for him to do this because I'm already ahead and I'm happy if he does this. He can't do this because if he does this and I did this, then it means I come out with the lead. Okay. What does Wukong need to do? Well, sounds like Wukong might need to do this. He might need to do this as well. He might need to do this. Definitely might need to do this, etc. In the event that he does any of these things and I didn't do as greedy as a root as I could, I'm still ahead, so I'm fine. I feel okay. I'm mentally okay. We're still ahead in the game. This is all fine. In the event that he does any of these and I anticipated it as a possibility and made intentional decisions to play around it, foregoing a greedier or a, you know, a more, you know, just, just a greedier way of playing or a normal standard Morgana way of playing, but that she doesn't need to do because she's already ahead, then she completely asphyxiates Wukong's ability to come back in the game. She's played against his range. This extends into every lane, every matchup, every draft, everything else. So this is just game theory. So this is the way that decisions um, should be like broken down, thought about, assessed, analyzed, all these other types of things. And then when you end up reaching conclusions about something that I talked about a little bit earlier, which is autonomy, how do you reach the conclusion of autonomy? Autom autonomy in a lane is ultimately discussed or determined up until a theory. Not a theory in the sense of an idea, but a theory in the sense of a repeatedly done test or exercises that sim or seem to produce a relatively similar result um, time and time again. And the interesting thing about theory is that it's always based on current information or current knowledge or current understanding. So 
the current theory of how some of these lanes will go is that, you know, A has autonomy over B and C has autonomy over D. Well, how do you reach these conclusions? You play these games or you determine the options or the limitations of these champions over and over repeatedly until you see, okay, if I just do this every time, nothing happens here. If I do this every time, you can't do anything here. If I do this every time, you can't do this. And then what happens is you build, you build a very wide range at first of things that can happen, and then you refine upon it, and then you get a conclusion like, okay, if I do this, it accounts for a very wide, a very wide amount of your options, right? So if this is player A versus player B, for initially player A tries lots of different things in the lane, tries lots of different things over, over the course of you know hundreds, and hundreds or dozens of games. And player A picks out the ones that worked and the ones that didn't work, right? So he picks out, he picks out the O's and he picks out uh, the X's. Then he goes back and he goes back to the drawing board and he's like, okay, I can do my O a little bit different. And if I do my O a little bit different, the upside is still great enough that it actually counters a lot of your, your X's. And then what ends up happening is the X tries to then see the O's refinement. The X goes back to the drawing board and tries to determine, can I do anything different to stop this refinement that this person just did? You do it over and over and over and over. And eventually, both of them will reach relative conclusions that is, you know, very narrowed down to a, a very small amount of uh, options or like ways to go about something based on current understanding and cur current knowledge. This is why when you hear me talk about international play, it's very different compared to regional play um, or like LCK, LPL, uh, LCS or LEC, because the level of competition is different, which also means that the level of ranges is different based on what can people prepare for. Summit, if you gave Summit, for instance, um, I s still stand by, he's one of the best mechanical top laners in the entire world. If you give Summit NAR or you give Summit Jace, or you give Summit, you know, uh, Lucian, or you give Summit any of these mechanical champions in top lane, there is a good chance that 90% of the time, he will just bulldoze the LCS opposition. He will beat the enemy opponent. That's fine. So if you know that Summit is going to bulldoze the opponent 90% of the time by doing what he's always done, why would you make a refinement? Well, the reason is, is because while Summit, with his range... So again, Summit has a 90% range uh, of just doing the same few things, right? He can do the same very few things. He could do four things and just keep beating NA, right? Why would you make a refinement here? Well, because these very same things and the way that they were arrived at as a big picture thing, they stem from lots of very microscopic refinements, to allow him to pulverize weaker opposition. Now what happens when Summit gets to Worlds and he's no longer playing against, you know, Fate God in top lane. He's no longer, uh, you know, uh, playing against uh, just, ra you know, random, random like fill in top laners, random bottom of the standing top laners in LCS. What happens to Summit? Well, he tries these same ranges, but when he tries these same ranges, the people at Worlds have answers for his refinements. They have, they have answers for his range. So now what? Do you coin flip, which now produces a lot of variants, that he's going to end up getting an advantage against an equally skilled person or another mechanically very well-refined player? Or do you look for other edges? You obviously look for other edges in order to reduce variance and give yourself the greatest upside. So how do you reduce variance and give yourself greater upsize? By min-maxing. How do you min-max? You min-max through making it so that you have the highest likelihood and possibility to do the most damage, have the least requirements, have the least onus on you inside of the game to do things, require maybe less resources, have more forgiveness on mistakes, etc. You do all of these things in an effort to collide with someone equally skilled, but give yourself the upper hand. Welcome to the extension of runes and itemization, drafting, champion assessment, matchup assessment, lane phase, economy, understanding of recall, understanding how certain items curve, and understanding differences like second items on you, third items on you, etc. It all starts at a really deeply built up 
foundation of the game. That's where it all starts. People who are making incorrect itemization choices that are either mathematically able to be shown or even inside of the game, if it's not as mathematical, you're able to practically show it, like in a practical sense, you're able to show it, or you're able to pick apart things and deconstruct it and you know go piece by piece and evaluate things. People who are doing these things can't possibly be thinking about these things because if they were, it is impossible to likely arrive at the conclusions that they're arriving at. And this is what I talk about when I talk about treasure hunting. You don't actually have to find the treasure. You just have to be warm. And what I mean by that is if, um, you know, you, if you take a metal detector to a beach or you go to, you know, 50 different beaches, your metal detector is able to find at least the correct beach that the treasure's at, the, 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 the buried hidden treasure. You're warm. You might not have gotten the absolute best answer. You might not have found the treasure, but you're warm. And you're warm because you follow the clues and you have a fundamental uh, process about how you deconstruct things and how you approach things, how you think about things, how you do these things. And if you have this process, if you have the system to do these things, you can do it time and time again, regardless of what happens, because that is a formula not an answer. And it's more important to understand the formula than it is to just know the answer. Because if you know the answer, it means that you have to do a lot of trial and error and hope that you get lucky with the answer and arrive at a, a good conclusion um, if you don't understand the formula. So what ends up happening here is Summit goes to Worlds and he's evenly matched with a lot of top laners and now he never you know, developed a draft champion pool. Maybe you guys aren't flexing or anything like that. You can't get these micro edges. And if he's itemizing poorly, it reduces, even if it's by a fraction of a percent, a, z a, a minus zero point, you know, a, 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 you know, a negative, a negative 0.3% chance to kill the opponent inside of a fight had you just had another item is still a minus 0.3%. Now it's very odd to me that in other games this is understood, but in League of Legends, I have been preaching to the choir, screaming at the sky for three years. And despite an ability to demonstrate this, both publicly and privately, and uh, be able to explain it, draw parallels, show examples of it, be able to discuss it very deeply uh, about how it exists in other games and show examples of how it exists in other games and the way that it was arrived at in other games and the methods that you can do all of this, there is still an odd amount of resistance towards the conversations and a lot of them you guys might have noticed because a lot have happened publicly happen because of emotions people say like they feel like something should happen right also the while being able to look at lots of different examples and actually seeing that that's not the case whether it be because of recency bias or because of their own subjective experiences and stuff. And then some people might say, but Ellis, aren't your own experiences subjective? Um, aren't your own examples that you've seen and you've looked at subjective? And that's where, if anyone watched my original come up on coaching and casting, I never really had exact examples. It was always, can this champion do this? And the answer is yes. Okay, we'll do it next time. Can this champion do this? Can that champion do that? Can this champion reflect here? Can you do this in the jungle clear? Is this possible? Is that possible? Is this is possible. It was always that. It wasn't one example. It was a plethora of different micro examples that build up into something bigger and ends up painting like a much uh, a much more detailed or larger picture. So that that's how you get there. And it makes me very depressed as someone who my entire game is uh, my entire life is games. I've been playing games since, you know, I, I, I was super young. I've been playing games and I was playing all different types of games. I was speed running games at age three because my uncle used to like to do time attack. It used to be called time attack mode. My uncle used to do, like to do time attack mode. So I understood what it was to take shortcuts and why you took a shortcut and certain mechanics in games that you had to do in order to, again, keep shaving down the number, keep refining, keep building. But for some reason in League of Legends and coaching staffs, there is a level of complacency or a level of ignorance on these things that are very clearly demonstrable. They are very present inside of so many different games. They're very easily talked about. They're very easily discussed. Now, well, they're very easily discussed if people are uh, willing to accept the answer or have a conversation. But sometimes people need to be brought up to the level of being able to have the conversation of it in the first place. This would be equivalent to, you know, maybe in mathematics or something. 
You try to teach a certain math equation to someone that doesn't understand the formula or that level of math. Before you can begin to have an honest conversation about that, you would need to bring them up to that level first before having the discussion with them. Because if you just give it to them in layman's terms, there's a chance that either they do or don't accept it. In League of Legends, it tends to be that they don't accept it unless you have credentials or titles. But that doesn't make sense because that wouldn't make sense in science and it wouldn't make sense in math. You can make a presentation and if you were scientifically or mathematically accurate or you were able to demonstrate the things that you're saying it would not matter if you have never uh you know done all of these other things if you can show that it's right without again a rebuttal being present or um something else being present and the app or the 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 existence of failure a MITS test does not mean that it's a failure. It does not mean that that is a rebuttal in and of itself if you're trying to make the claim that ace-king is better than ace-queen. The existence of queens coming on the flop and beating ace-king does not change that ace-king is favored. This is a understood thing. The ace-king is still favored. If you run the scenario many, many, many times, ace-king will come out on top. In League of Legends, Reddit, Twitter, and other people that I've engaged in arguments with, they will claim that the existence of the queen coming on the flop simply means that K can, or a king cannot come or that king is not realistic. There exists a further problem when... The introduction of new knowledge is not something that is either understood or accepted. What I mean by that is that all things are, again, if we go back in time to something I was just talking about, it's all brought up to theory. Now, this is something I've never been opposed to, and I've always been open about in all of my videos and conversations. A lot of uh, statements that I make or um, uh, claims that I might make about certain champions are, are based on, you know, theory, um, you know, which is then uh, extended from a lot of the stuff that I just talked about. And sometimes it often even does entertain that there are possibilities to do things that are not commonly happening. Now, if you go back in time and you search YouTube and you search LSF keys, okay, this, why you should use F keys to improve your game gameplay i was laughed at ridiculed mocked and said that it was really stupid no pro used f keys no pros uh see there's a comment right here six years later now and pros are starting to use it was i wrong in 2015 for making all the statements that i made about f keys was i incorrect to make those statements about f keys no i wasn't was I able to prove why, whether it be in a, a you know an efficiency standpoint or something else, why F keys are superior? Yes, I was. I was able to, but it was not commonly accepted theory. It was not accepted as you know something because it was uh, that's too hard for pros. That's not logical, or they just simply say that it's not efficient, or that you know all this other stuff. I've battled this time and time again all throughout my career. I did it with Leandres versus Morello, which was a much easier argument because I had math on my side. It wasn't just a practicality argument, although practicality was a part of it. I finally achieved my goal after a year and a half or two years of Morello versus Leandre, but my praise for Leandre actually started in 2017 when I noticed how broken the damage output of it was. Slowly, some pros began to actually start building Leandres over Morello and Omicon. Those pros were Nemesis and Larson were the two I first noticed in the LEC because they were looking for things that were demonstrable and they found it. Because they actually bothered to entertain was it actually accurate, regardless of what the public consensus or the you know, public opinion was, they didn't have bias or prejudice against the claims. So they were able to further better themselves quicker than their peers. After doing this for a year and a half, two years, Riot finally fucking gave me one of the highest accolades that you can get in the entire game. And they added me to the League of Legends shop as an Easter egg. And it was the first edition in six years following Total Biscuit. Um, and obviously, I got very emotional because that is me essentially submitting a paper to be peer reviewed in the scientific or math community and actually being right. So I got very emotional over that because it was a battle that I could prove that I was right in and I came out victorious. So since then, I've done other things. I've tried to kill Black Cleaver's set. I've tried to kill Collector uh, over Lord Dom's, uh, you know, or 
Lord Danny's regards. I've tried to argue about practicality. I've started telling people, put your mouse over the Oblivion Orb. Put your mouse over the Kempunk uh, Sword. Put your mouse over the Morello. Put your mouse over this, right? Because I have to beg people to try to do these things that are so obvious and it's so disheartening. And when my entire life is centered around this and I was working 80, 100 hours a week at certain points, right? Co-streaming so many different regions, casting the LCK. There's people that just don't like people like me. It's so I was I was having a conversation with Mewtwo King recently, and um, I always said that I had enormous respect for Mewtwo King. The way that he approached the game, the way that he found frame data before anyone else, the way that he was made fun of, the way that he was mocked for doing these things way before his time. He was mocked, and he people treated him with you know b before he became Mewtwo God, and he was just untouchable, and he became the machine. I had so much respect for Mewtwo King always, and I absolutely loved his persona. But for some reason, the world doesn't like people that try to tell others how to do some stuff better, or um, they don't like uh, when when people uh, try to say that you're doing something wrong because no one wants to be wrong, right? Some people just want to be left alone. Um, you know, some people don't want to be told about these, these, these various things. And, um, obviously some, someone would have a rebuttal to that and say, LS, it's not about, um, how you tell them you're wrong. It's, it's, or it's, it's not about that. You tell them it's wrong. It's how you say it without realizing that people reach the abrasiveness, uh, level or the spectacle level of saying things because no one's listening, right? The, the whole spectacle, uh, I, I talked about this many times. Spectacle is necessary to get people to listen. Spectacle is necessary to get people to pay attention. And this has worked time and time again. Um, and so until, you know, I reach a different theory on a better way to go about it, I'm left with this. Some people say it's in the form of videos, maybe like this one, if this one gets fully edited and uploaded to YouTube. Some people say it's in the forms of EDU uh, content, um, you know, and other stuff like that. But the problem with that is that it's very, very, very slow. It's a lot slower than just streaming it and being on Twitter and being on Instagram and everything like that. And then you, you th there's there's so many uncertainties, like what rebuttals maybe didn't I consider while making the video? What things did I maybe not immediately counter? And then there might be thousands of comments or ideas that you just didn't discuss in the video. And so it makes these types of videos and this type of content very stressful to make because you have to account for so much and then you have to be willing to put yourself in a situation to be ridiculed and flamed and everything. And I was always fine with that. I was born in the flame. I was born in the fire. I pushed back against all the standard norms and everything. So what I'm trying to explain is that these processes are not like a, a fucking LS thing. These, I well, I mean, maybe in the sense that this is what I do, but nothing I'm saying is erroneous when it comes to determining things or um, reaching conclusions and stuff. Now, just because I have a theory does not mean that I am unwilling to change the stance on the theory. But the same way that maybe a currently, uh, you know, uh, you know, believed theory exists, you're not going to change it just because you said so, right? A flat earther is not going to uh, change the, 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 the view of the earth being a globe by just saying, like, I feel like it, man. I went to the beach. I saw the horizon, you know, like. They're not, they're not gonna, they're not gonna talk about like, you know, flight paths and everything. They're not gonna do anything like that, right? So, the same way that other things, like, no one just accepted that Morello was worse than Leandre. You had to prove it. So, how do you prove certain things? Well, it takes a lot of time, takes a lot of effort um, to prove certain things. And likewise, the invert is true. I'm not unwilling to change a certain stance on a matchup dynamic or um, a bot lane dynamic or um, a 5v5 dynamic as long as there is something that has not already been considered or factored in um, that goes against whoever has autonomy in that situation um, or just accepting, again, it's a possibility. Just because someone has a draft advantage does not mean that they win. There is no 100-0 draft. There's no such thing. There is no such thing as a 100-0 draft. There's no such thing as probably even a 99 to 1 draft. I do think there are really gross drafts. I do think there are 90 10s. I do think that those exist. I think those are very rare. Those are three losing lanes, losing jungle matchup, losing themes, and losing scaling, and like enemy uh, is able to purchase their items for cheaper, come online faster, dragon stack reliably, get early heralds and everything too without like having to actually rotate to commit to them. Those things do happen. Yes, 
just like in card games, just like in poker, just like in these other things. They do exist. They're just freakishly rare. So most drafts are like 80-20s or 70-30s. And the goal should be to fight for the largest draft edge that you can. Why fight for the largest draft edge? Well, because we said the difference in a chance to win being 3% versus 4% is massive. It's absolutely huge if you can do it for free. If you can deal 0.6% more damage in a team fight by making conscious decisions to itemize or rune better in a fight, doesn't matter that it's only 0.6%. That's still 0.6% more of the time that you never would have had had you just done something that you're in total control of differently and you should be min-maxing. It confuses me why there's so much resistance towards this in League of Legends. Confuses me why things like this are so commonly fought against. Confuses me why a lot of things like this um, are just very odd, right? I started making the cookie compilations because I got tired of cookies, but cookies are a much harder battle to win. And people that take cookies aren't even technically wrong. And I've already explained why taking cookies technically isn't even wrong and why it's a much more difficult battle to fight than just saying, haha, cookies bad. Even if that's what I do on my stream and what I do sometimes in highlight videos or like co-streams or, you know, other stuff. I understand cookies, in theory, do actually have a practical use, even if it is that we just currently can't utilize it. Same way that maybe back six years ago, players weren't ready to use F keys. Maybe there can be a usage for cookies. But my problem and my continued resistance towards it is that currently there is no display of those aforementioned reasons to actually justify the cookies, even if in theory it ought to be possible. And because of the way that the games are played and because of the ways that cookies are actually used in the people approach landing phase, we don't actually get to see lots of examples. And it's very difficult to even ask the question of like what would happen. But I have a different video on that. Uh, it talks about cookies and scorch and how cookies and scorch could actually be really, really good. And this is before the nerf to cookies and uh, the buff to scorch and everything, right? Versus gathering storm. So other stuff, right? Some people are asking me during the stream, uh, LS, how do you know that Ivern is unmovable? Well, based on current theory, Ivern is unmovable. Based on so many different tests, so many intentionally manufactured just very rigged tests where, you know, we, we give the enemy lane opponent as much ammo as they possibly can. Something that would never happen in a pro game or a competitive game. Still, between various and many, many different pro players and many, many different types of matchups, we could not find a way to move Ivern. So, it does not mean that Ivern is unmovable. It does not mean that Ivern's impervious and that actually just no one can move him. It could be that our ability to ask the next question of what if this laner did this in this spot versus Ivern instead, and we just don't see it yet. We lack the ability to see it. So it's not a possibility to us because we lack the ability to see it. Based on current observations, tests, and everything else that we've done, back in spring, me and Fudge concluded no one actually moves Ivern. We tried as hard as we could. We got all the biggest lane bullies. And what we found was that Ivern always had a way to either take certain runes, take different starting items, and Ivern could come out even. But then you have to go the next step and define what is even and is that winning for Ivern. Now you have to entertain other variables, and now it's a different conversation. The problem is, is well, I can talk about all of this, and I can sit here, and I can, you know, rapid fire off all these things, and how long I've been in esports, and I can talk about all the different games that I've played at all the different levels that I've played, and I've been a part of, and stuff. It's not fun. It's it, it's 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 not fun doing this when uh, someone can just say no, -uh. and the ability to to show that no -uh isn't right is so difficult, and it's mentally taxing. To know that so many of these things were either eventually proven true or eventually proven accurate and to have so many of my really old VODs um, be starting to like ring true in modern like League of Legends, I'm talking season four, season five, etc. To, to know and be willing to demonstrate, be willing to go into a Coliseum and show that these things are accurate, right, which was the, the C9 adventure. Um, be willing to do it. And again, the problem with the C9 adventure is... All I set out to prove was that Ace King be Ace Queen, right? I didn't say I was going to win Worlds. So the goal was to make semis, right? That, that's what I said the goal was. 
I believed with enough stuff it was possible. That's what I believed. I believed that the roster was skilled enough, and I believed that uh, I believed in myself and my ability to eventually make the blind see, right? Which, look at Leandre Morello, right? Um, I'm very confident in being able to make the blind see. Um, and so I knew that even if it would be difficult, even if there would be turbulence, I fully believed in my, my, my ability to do it. But the reason that I believed in the ability to do it is because of so many things that I've already demonstrated publicly that have nothing to actually do with me on a personal level. They have nothing to do with me on a personal level. The formulas or the methods that people should use to reach conclusions have nothing to do with the person, right? The Belveth Clear on YouTube. You guys remember I was getting very emotional because I couldn't do it when Belveth first came out. There was a, there's a YouTuber that was able to do two very fast Belveth Clears. He made videos showing that it was possible. And he was able to replicate it very consistently. I could say, no, nah, it's not consistent. I could say, no, nah, I can't do it. I can only do it one in, one in 20 times. It's not worth it, man. It's not, it's not practical. The problem with the Belveth Clear is, doesn't leave you with less health, doesn't make you more susceptible to invades, doesn't actually have any downsides. There's no downside to the Belveth Clear. So I can't use the argument that it's not worth it because there's only upsides. It's a neutral positive. It's a fucking free roll. I can't use that argument. But that's a common cop out that a lot of pros will say. They'll say it's too hard to allocate attention or dedicate uh, towards doing whatever that is. And that's their cop out. That's how they get away from practicing it. That guy came out and said it took him six hours to learn the Belveth Clear. I, I believe it was six hours. It took him six hours. What happens if he quits at five? What happens if he quits at five? Why didn't he quit at five? Why didn't he quit at five? Let's say that during the course of that six hours, let's say he did 600 trials. Now, just like how I reached conclusions on champion drafts, team fights, uh, meta analysis, and everything else, it is a combination of very micro things. It's not all at once. There's no one VOD to point to. There's no one series to point to. It is a combination of many things. Well, LS, what do you mean by that? At try 493, he realized something on maybe Gromp that he didn't know before. When he was initially starting out the clears on try 211, he found something on Raptors that he didn't know before. Okay? On try 303, he found something on Golems that he didn't know before. On try 56, he found something on Red Buff that he didn't, he, didn't, uh, he didn't find before. Combine all of the discovered things, and what do you get? You get the Belveth Clear. It is a combination of many, many examples, many trial and errors, many tests, many theories. Maybe I could have done that better. Maybe I could have put my mouse here. Maybe I could have stood here. But he didn't stop. He didn't give up. He kept doing it, and he kept adding to his list of refinements to develop the Belveth Clear. And once he did it, he was able to replicate it. Which now means that everyone who chooses not to do it, myself included, is just fucking wrong. We're just simply wrong. We're bad. We're being ineffective. And we are losing out on free advantages that if we just weren't fucking lazy and we put the time in, we would gain access to. The same way that if you don't want to itemize correctly... In order to move your chance of winning from 0 0.6 to 0 0.8, you're just fucking wrong. If it's totally free and it's within your control, you are just fucking wrong. It's not an opinion. It's not an opinion. If it's able to be demonstrated. Now, what happens if he doesn't make the video at six, 600? What if he doesn't make the Belveth video clear at 600? So, okay, let's, let's, let's erase. At 56, he tells people, hey... Belveth can do this at red. Okay. They say, yeah, but her clear is still this. Okay. Then I, I forgot the numbers that I wrote above. Was it 211 for Raptors? Then at 211, he says, hey, Belveth can do this at Raptors. And people are still like, yeah, but I mean, she still can't clear it. Like, that's nice about red and Raptors and everything, but like still. And then he's like, no, 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 but I, I think something can be done on Golems. I think something can be done on Gromp. And they're like, nah, man, I've tried so many times. You know, I, I've tried it too, dude. You're just, you're wasting your time. I've. I've tried it as well. Like, it just, just doesn't work, you know? I've gone and I've tried it. And he says, 
yeah, but I think that you did something wrong. So then on trial 303, he finds the Gromp thing. Now the person that was so sure that they had tried everything says, huh? Yeah, but I mean, her clear is still slow. Like, I mean, I don't know how you found the Gromp thing. Like, I mean, I, I was trying to clear as her too, but like, I mean, her clear is still slow. I mean, it, it, there's no way to actually get it faster than that. Maybe there's a seed planted at this point, which is, I told the guy no on this and he was right. I told the guy no on this and he was right. And I was adamant and I was so sure that nothing was pro possible at Gromp and he was right again. The seed's been planted. So I think this is what happened with my career. I think slowly the seed was planted. Um, and I think that's what happened. Um, and then obviously, again, you, you fast forward to the Belveth thing. But this is why it is not an easy discussion is because you cannot pinpoint or discuss you know, the 56th trial, the 211th trial, the 303rd trial, you can't easily pinpoint these. What you can do is you can remember the variables that led to it. You can remember how it happened, under what circumstances, and then you can go further and ask yourself the question, is this, is this demonstrable? Is it recreatable? And if you're willing to challenge it and you're willing to show it, then it should be, um, you know, it, it, it should be something that has less uh, resistance to it and everything. So... It, it's very unsettling. Um, now, again, I'm not always right. There's been plenty of things that I learned otherwise about, right? Because again, all I'm trying to do is I'm trying to use everything that I've done with formulas and whatever else to develop a theory. And the theory is based on stuff that I just talked about. Sometimes it's just based on pure math on items. Other times it's based on a willingness to demonstrate an argument that I believe is more compelling than the argument that you have. And that if we do enough sequences or simulations, etc., I'm I believe that it would lead to this result if you do it with intention. Now, why does Ivern Mid suck? So some people said to me that Ivern Mid is not unbreakable. It's just that the players that we were all playing against was bad. And that Do and B said on stream that they Ivern mid or that Ivern showed up in scrims in China, um, or like Enchanter showed up on on scrims in China. I have now. I don't. I, I'm not fucking. You know. I'm not all knowing here. I would bet a lot of money with a lot. With I would bet so much money on this. They do not understand Ivern's goal. They don't know why you're picking Ivern and for what purpose. They don't know his runes. They don't know his item curves. They don't know the differences in his breakpoints for his, his wave clear. Maybe they learned the wave clear and stuff, but they probably don't know the items. Probably don't know the runes. Probably don't know the build order. And even if they copied that one game from Fudge, evidently they didn't. You guys remember when Faker played two Soraka games after Fudge played it in LCS? Faker had the wrong runes. Faker had bad recalls. Faker built Bandle Glass Mirror. He rushed Bandle Glass Mirror on Soraka. Faker built Shirelias on Soraka. Faker didn't realize that you can proc Moonstone against the enemy laner before you cast your R for an absolutely broken R at level 6. That's broken. Your bot lane in a 2v3? Maybe rank 1 Soraka R won't do it, but what if my Moonstone's at max stacks and then I press R because Moonstone had a change that allowed it to ramp up in combat. Soraka's not there to make you go fast. She's there to invalidate an opponent's attempt to kill you. She is there to act as a barrier. She is there to put a divine shield on you, is essentially what she's doing. She's there to stop what the opponent's doing, not make you do whatever the hell you want to do, unless it's stomping them early in mid because her items cost less, she functions on less economy, which also means that even if she gets zoned off or she takes a couple of bad trades, she can still function because she has a lower econ than every other champ in the game because of her items, because her base scaling is so good as well, because she can gain access to the support item and mid-late game transition, it also means she can get another really easy mythic or legendary, and then she can get access to the support item that's super broken for its cost and like a lot of other things. I know that none of this stuff is entertained. That's why no one has the right rune. No one, no one has runes. No one, no one plays lane with intent. This goes back to the cookies and scorch comment. Maybe cookies and scorch is right, but the way that everything's being done with cookies and scorch doesn't allow us to actually know if that's true. And even if Ivern was being picked in LPL or in LPL scrims, yeah, you're right, he was. 
when Korea 9 was playing versus them too. And I was the Ivern versus the Chinese mid laners when me and Daisy would either solo kill them or they couldn't break me. And me and Malice would just get every single dragon. Yeah. Now, yes, we're not playing the, the absolute tip-top LPL players, but that has nothing to do with what can the champions do, which is, again, how we reach the conclusion. But also, in those scrims where Ivern's coming out in China, or even in Korea, or even Japan, because we scrimmed lots of teams, right? The enemies are not taking full lane runes against Ivern. They're not. They're not doing it. They're not taking... Man, I just gotta fucking ram this Ivern, man. I just gotta pummel him into the ground. They're not doing that, man. They're not doing that. That's not their intent. So even if you want to argue that there is a discrepancy between the level of players that the Ivern tests were done against, even if you want to make that argument, the tests were so skewed to be disadvantageous to Ivern and we couldn't find an answer. Now again, I'm not willing to just accept that that's wrong. Okay? But based on current understanding of the champions, current understanding of the champion Syndra, Victor, Oriana, um, you know, uh, uh, at the time, Vex, etc. Um, based on the current understanding of their damage as a champion, not player, the things that they can do to the minion wave, how quickly they can shove a minion wave, how they can trade against Ivern, the cooldowns, based on all these things, that was the original hypothesis. I don't think Ivern can be moved. That was the original hypothesis. It was based on the champions, not anything about players. Now again, the theory might be wrong. Maybe if you're Chovy or Faker or Showmaker, you break Ivern. Yeah, probably. Probably break Ivern. But it probably also doesn't have to do with Ivern. Probably has to do with Faker, Sho Chovy, Showmaker, Knight, you know, uh, Rookie, uh, etc. right? So now what happens when Faker, Chovy, Showmaker, Rookie, Knight, etc., BDD, whatever, play with the knowledge of Ivern. Play with the knowledge of Ivern, with the right runes, with the right builds, with the intent from start to finish, from the second they load into the game, they have a purpose. They have a meaning in the game. And they will play only and only to that range. Only to that range against the opponent's options. What happens then? Because I don't doubt, maybe... Chovy, Chovy, or, uh, you know, Chovy, Chovy, Faker collide, Ivern versus Syndra, Victor, first time, Faker has wrong runes, different things, he's trying to trade against him, he's sh shoving lanes incorrectly, he's building Bandle Glass Mirror first item, he's not getting Dark Seal, he's, you know, building Shirelias on Ivern, all this other, yeah, maybe Faker loses, but what happens when his runes are right, when his starting items are correct, when he understands nuance with like Ivern's brushes and the brush timings and learns to keep track of the brush timings so that you don't fall behind to the cooldown level one um, per, per the stack regeneration. What happens then? That's the question I'm interested in, but that's not the question that people, are uh, people uh, that are interested in claiming that it's wrong are having. And that's all that I care about. So this is a very long um, discussion, obviously, um, about processes and how to reach conclusions. And I feel like I haven't done a talk like this literally in like six or seven years or something. I, I feel like I haven't had a talk like this. I feel like I just stopped making videos or, or, or having talks like this. And I'm doing it right now, obviously, live on stream. And it's because it's so time consuming. And it also just feels like it's, it's useless. And it, it, it makes me feel empty inside. I know that I'm going to finish this video. I'm going to keep trying to just fucking do excellence. Uh, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep, you know, obviously it's not going to be perfect. I might think to myself later, like, hey, I could have said this better. Maybe I should have used that analogy, this explanation. It's not going to be perfect, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to chase making a really good video. And hopefully it's excellent. And um, hopefully it's a good video. Um, it disheartens me that I can have these conversations. And I can have these conversations because I have lived, breathed, ate, and slept games all my life and they're all that I know and it's all that I ever wanted to do was was play games and make some sort of a job out of games and I, I, I thought games are art I, I think that showing that hey I can itemize better hey I can make this build better hey I can refine better hey I can you know beat this course on Mario Kart faster than you by doing these things that is beautiful to me that's art to me that is art I, I love looking at it I love seeing stuff like that. It's very pretty to me. Um, 
that is a way to express myself. Um, it's, it's, it's a form of um, self-expression, right? Uh, being able to talk about these things, have these conversations, being wanting to learn. And part of my frustration is it feels like a lot of stuff that can be learned right now, it's very difficult because the game is stagnating. And I've even said is actually going backwards in a lot of ways. Um, and that disheartens me and that affects my mental health. And I feel like people um, like to thought police certain things that I say or things around me um, because they don't like that I can get abrasive. Uh, they don't like that I can raise my voice or that I can be very mean or I come off um, condescending um, or all these other types of things. And um, though even those things were reached because no one was listening, right? So then I realized, hey, if they're spectacle, people oddly pay attention. So I, I relied on spectacle, had this talk with Jat, had this talk with other casters in the scene. Um, and I made that my casting style as well was to center stuff around spectacle. But I've never run from a fight if I thought that it was in good faith uh, or like an argument or anything like that. Some people will cite like um, the Cadrill Renekton thing. And to that, I would obviously say like, I didn't feel like it was in good faith. That, that was my honest interpretation. I thought it was a low blow that I was live on the LEC broadcast when he tweeted that at me. I felt like it was a low blow that so many people who are angry and looking for an opening um, just got riled up by it and they, they felt really good by it. I felt very hurt um, and angry at that, which is why I never did it. Um, now, fast forward, here we are, you know, a uh, year and a half later or whatever, and me and Cajal are making a podcast for Worlds together. Um, you know, and I've had many off stream talks with Cadrill. Cadrill wasn't the person that I thought that he was when I was really angry at Cadrill. And, um, I, you know, I, 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 we had like our, our Twitter beef and we had other stuff that, you know, would happen. Um, I had an idea about Cadrill that changed after having many combos with him. Uh, because again, I am a believer in that actions over an extended period of time are infinitely more honest than any words a human can mutter. So that's how we arrived here. Um, so I'm always opposed to these conversations. The problem is, is some people have asked Ellis, why don't you go on talk shows? Why don't you go on podcasts? How long have I been going off about this? And I'm the only one talking right now. This is not a, there, there is so much to unpack and have a discussion about. There is so much to do. And I understand that debates are not about winning or like losing the debate. It's about the audience or the, the spectator or something like that. And to that, uh, I would say that I do not try to create an echo chamber. People at my stream know I never ban people. I invite people to come on voice chat all the time. I invite people to calls. I invite, you know, pro players that are making fun of me in Twitch chat to calls. And then sometimes we end up even uh, having friendly relations after, right? Mickey X, the iconic Friesen talk. Um, where I propose that there are spots where, you know, caps or perks could have froze and it left the opponents without options, even though Mickey X was memeing, uh, herder, freeze isn't possible. Freeze doesn't make sense. Open up the VODs, go frame by, you know, step by step, screenshot by screenshot. Could he freeze here? What would the opponent do? Nothing. Could he freeze here? What would the opponent do? Nothing. Could he freeze here? What would the opponent do? Nothing. Okay. Just like the Belveth clear. So you take that, find another VOD, do it again. Take that, find another VOD, do it again. What's the purpose of doing this? And what circumstances is it good? Is it always just good to freeze? No. What circumstances is it good? What are the variables? Can we create these variables? Can we manufacture them? Can we draft in a way that would allow us to have this as an option that would provide us with a very good or higher probability chance to win the game based on how the lanes are and everything? Yes, we can. We can, and that's beautiful. We've, we've found something. Now let's try to use it. And I want to use it because I want to see, is there something I'm not seeing? Is there something I can learn? Is there something I'm not getting? Can something go wrong with this freeze? And the way that a lot of people argued it was Loco Doco back in the day, Just Do Baron, river control. So how did I fight the Loco Doco Just Do Baron? I tracked the Baron capture speeds for the entirety of that worlds, including when the team had a very gross Mountain Dragon stack, when Mountain Dragon used to do uh, true damage to uh, objectives and neutral uh, monsters. I tracked every single one. I went through every VOD. And I said, okay, great. Now we know that these types of champions have roughly this amount of time to burst a Baron 
if these variables are present. We, as the team that is on the receiving end of a potential barren burst, can learn this. Same way that we can learn to do F keys. Same way that we can learn that the jungler can't always gank us. The same way that we can learn to take a cheater recall. The same way that we can learn how much time it takes us to get back to lane so that we can get a recall. Same way that we can rotate around the map and do even more complex things like lane swaps. We can learn this too. We know that if we start freezing and the opponents disappear into the fog of war, based on where they last disappeared, their champions have a fixed movement speed. A lot of the movement speeds are relatively similar to each other, which means that based on when we last saw them, we can track them through the fog of war the way that an RTS player does. The way that a mo uh, 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 an MMORPG player does when uh, an enemy goes stealth and you know how quickly they can run. You know that they can only possibly be within a certain radius. If someone just robbed your house and they ran out of the house and they're on foot, you can see how quickly they're running away. You can see roughly how quick they are on foot. If a helicopter comes, you know that there is a radius. There is a limitation to how far they could have gotten. This has nothing to do with League of Legends. This is just game strategy. This is just game theory, game, game talk. And so that's what I did to Loco Doco. Then I said, pull up any VOD, I'll show you freezes. So I just went out, I went to a stream one day and um, said, pull up any VOD, I'll, fi I'll, fi I'll find a freeze. Because I believe that the variables are so plentiful that I can find freezes, assuming that the variables are there. And I believe that they are so plentiful. So we did. And we went, we went step by step. And um, then he, again, that's where we get to the just do Baron or uh, vision is important. Now I'm starting to make the claim that vision is not as important as people believe that it is. The reason I make this claim is because I come from RTSs where you were supposed to do absolutely absurd things that if you did in 2001 and you jump forward to, you know, even, even a 2010 RTS player, you would just believe it's not possible. You would... Let me, let me show you an example of a pro player mind gaming the other pro player. Guy in chat, you're right. This is it. Okay, let me explain what's going on. Let me explain what's going on. This overlord right here, this is an aerial, this is a, this is a spaceship that grants vision in a radius. This is a spaceship, essentially, that grants vision in a radius. These are usually placed at very uh, tactically, you know, like ver very tactical decisions to alert the Zerg player, right? The alien race, okay? It's used to alert the alien race about the military, the, 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 the army movements of the opponent. They're usually placed above like cliffs, above like, you know, terrain where they cannot be shot down by Marines. They can't be killed by very small units. This would be like, um, this would, imagine, imagine that there, imagine, uh, that Kane could stay in E, uh, on red buff and permanently watch you. Uh, you can't see Kane. You can't see Kane. You know how it like shows you the eye? It shows you that Kane's somewhere, but you can't see Kane. That's what the Overlord is. Okay? It's like Kane inside of terrain when you can't see him and you can't see the eye. He's just watching. Okay. So Zerg players use this information to know when to build army, when to build defensive structures, etc., based on their opponent's map movements. So. What does Casey do? Casey knows that July Zerg is a pro as well. Casey knows that, see, this is a cliff. This is a big cliff. The Marines can't walk over the cliff. They're not a League of Legends player. Um, low player might try to walk over the cliff here to shoot the, the Overlord. Who knows? Um, the Marines don't have cookies. They, uh, you know, they can't, they can't do stuff like that. But the Overlord is safe over the cliff. Now, Casey knows that July Zerg is a pro. Now, the, the Marines obviously have range, just like a, you know, Victor, like a range champion in LoL. So they're going to walk here and they're going to tell the Overlord, hey, I want you to get back. Now, you can see that this Overlord's radius is really big right now. It can clearly see the expansion, which is the second base of the Terran. This is where the, the Terran will uh, set up another camp in order to gather more resources, right? He can, the Overlord can currently see it. It can currently see it. Now... He doesn't kill the Overlord. Okay, so the Overlord's still there. So now, what is the Overlord gonna do? The Overlord, you notice something? It sees the mineral nodes. This is money. These, these are money nodes. The Overlord 
is going to see when the workers or the harvesters or the harvester ants or the harvester bees, whatever you want to call them, come to start mining the mineral nodes. He's going to know an exact time. He has a clock. He's going to know an exact time. Maybe, maybe they come here at 4.57, right? Okay, what does that mean? Well, the command center build time is X, okay? The command center, which is the, the camp or the tent, is 400 minerals, which now he knows that that means that these, these Marines are also X minerals. So the Marines are, all, or, you know, C, command center is X, Marines are Y. So he knows that, okay, command center plus Marines spent plus this in-game timer, the Terran has Z gold, right? The, the Terran has access to Z gold. He can deduce how much gold the Terran has because he's a Zerg player. He also has workers that are also mining. He knows with almost absolute certainty, roughly, how much money his opponent has, exactly as a pro player, just based on the little information that he's seen. He's able to reach this conclusion. Okay, so now what is KC going to do? He knows that he's up against a pro player. He knows that the pro player will think like this. He knows that the pro player knows everything that he knows about this. He knows that the pro player is able to accurately keep track of timings, you know, uh, how long it takes Casey to move across the map and attack him. What does Casey do? There's no camp here. There's no camp here. But the overlord was moved backwards. The overlord was moved back here. The overlord can't see the camp. The overlord cannot see the triangle right now. The only thing the Overlord can see is the workers, the harvesters. July Zerg instantly thinks to himself, Casey spent 400 gold on, on, uh, on a camp. The camp took X amount of time. Casey also has Y amount of uh, Marines. That means Casey has exactly Z amount of gold. And that means that Casey's current infrastructure also means that he has this many buildings. Maybe, maybe Casey has five buildings. As soon as he sees these harvester ants, this is exactly what goes through July Zerg's brain. All of these things, just like a pattern, right? Did Lee Sin show on red? How much CS did he have? That's why we hit tab. How much CS did he have? He had 12? Where did he come from? Did he come from golems? Did he come from raptors? Did he come from raptors? But he also came from golems? That means he did raptors and golems. How quick does it take Lee Sin to clear raptors and golems? Well, I, I, I have a professional jungler on my team, too. He just told me how long it takes. Now I know if Lee Sin is ahead of time or behind time by a few seconds. This is the big deal with Karthus clear times. This is the big deal with Belveth clear times. This is the big deal with the Morgana clear time, which is why Owner was at red when he was, because Owner, as a professional, knows that Morgana has a certain clear time where she's susceptible to an invade, and she can be cheesed, and it can set Morgana really, really far behind. Owner understands this as a pro player, the same way that July Zerg understands all of this about the Terran, the, the human player. So why would, why would the human player do this? Why would he make such a big risk? Why would he take so many workers off of mining, significantly stunting his economy? He'll never win the game if he does this. His economy is going to be in shambles. He's not getting any money. And that means that he can't make more units. He can't make more buildings. Why, why would he do this? Because he's not actually building a tent. He's, making, he's using the workers to make July think everything that I just talked about. He's making July think, in case he doesn't have any uh, army. Casey doesn't have any buildings. Casey's not going to attack me for another couple of minutes. Casey just expanded. He just built a tent. It's going to be a couple of minutes. What is July going to do? July's not making any defensive structures. J July's not making any army. July is also going to say, oh, you're, you're making economy? I'm going to make economy. I'm going to tech. I'm going to try to get more gold. That's what July's thinking. And Casey knows that. Look at this. Look at it. Look. There it is. It can't see the campfire. It doesn't have the vision to see the campfire. But it can see the workers. It can see the workers. It has sight on the workers. So July thinks, oh, okay, I got nothing to, be, I, nothing, nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about. Oh, he's, he's farming. Oh, he's farming. Okay. Now that I know that he expanded, let me move my guy back to keep track of his army. Now that I know that he expanded... 
Now that I know that he wait. Wait, what what? Now 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 watch. He moves out. Wait, where'd the fire bat come from? Wait a minute. If he if he expanded, if he built a tent and he spent four hundred gold, he can't have gas, but a fire bat costs gas. He can't have gas. July knows, as a pro player, that it's impossible for Casey to have gas. It's it's impossible. If Casey had made the tent and actually expanded. But now he sees the fire bat, which means that Casey has gas, which also means that what the fuck were those workers doing on the minerals? What the fuck? Why did I just make drones? What the fuck's going on? He panics. He tries to make a defensive structure. It doesn't matter. Casey knows what he's doing. He made July believe that he was being really defensive. He made July believe that he spent hundreds and hundreds of gold into building his economy and building infrastructure. It's not what Casey was doing. July's too late on his timing. July tries to build an army, tries to build defensive structures, but it's, it's not in time. And the reason that it's not in time is because of those microseconds, literally the 10 seconds of those workers being on the minerals made July make so many different choices that made it impossible to stop the attack. And it all happened in 10 seconds. And the reason that it happens is because Casey knows that July knows that if Casey has workers at this campsite, that Casey can't have gas. Casey can't have fire bats. Casey can't have medics. Casey can't kill me. How can he kill me? It just expanded. Casey knows that July knows that. So Casey made a very big gamble. The same way that owner made a gamble. So... What did Canyon do when Owner made the gamble? Canyon didn't do Raptors and Red at the same time. In fact, he didn't even do Red. If you remember inside of the game, Owner or Can or sorry, Canyon skipped Red and went to Golems. What what is why would he do that? Because Canyon still understood something like this was a possibility. Now July, after he lost to this once, would be able to go back into this game and then he would be able to tell, how can I know that this is coming? And here's the answer. And we, we get to this through deductive reasoning. We get to this through deductive reasoning. The same thing I'm asking lol pros to do. There is a limited amount of workers that Casey could send to do this trick. To try to, to actually make this trick work. To make this deception work. He can only send a limited amount. Otherwise, he doesn't have the economy to keep pumping out units. Okay. So what can July do knowing this now in hindsight? This worker would have already hit the tent, which means if a tent was here, this worker would come back here in about three seconds. July, before moving his overlord or not paying any attention to it, could have waited to see, is there a return on the worker? That three seconds is different from 10 seconds. It is a net difference of seven seconds. July would never not in the future make the decision to not voluntarily within all of his control choose to not know the answer at three seconds as opposed to 10. The same way that if you had a 0.3% chance of winning, you would never not choose to increase it to uh, you know, a 0.9% chance of winning if it was totally in your control. Now, he learned this the hard way, but could a more advanced player, could a more advanced pro gamer have already known that this was a possibility? Could have an advanced pro gamer have seen this trick and known, I gotta be cognizant of that. I gotta keep that in mind as a possibility. Yes, they will. 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011 rolls around. They keep getting better. They keep getting more refined. Cheese becomes rarer and rarer because things like this, the pros got so fucking good at knowing the ranges, the options that the enemy had because they just kept grinding nonstop, endlessly, asking themselves this question. How can I stop this in real time? What can I do in my total control to stop this in real time and factor this into my range? How can I reach conclusions about my own range? This doesn't mean the game stops here. Now, you can build upon that. You can figure out that they understand and think like this, and maybe you can see if there's maybe some leeway. 
maybe certain maps have some leeway that you know that there's a certain weak spot. There's a certain opening that it doesn't matter if they've entertained that about the range. You can still get away with it. And that's the beauty in StarCraft. That's the beauty in art. It's the beauty in RTSs, card games, things like that. Very specific calculated decisions against people that almost seem like robots, almost like robots, but they're not robots, right? And I've never said that they're robots. But they kept chasing perfection and they obtained excellence and they got better and better and better and better and better and better all over the years. They got so much better and it became so much harder to do things. So when Flash pulls off a cheese, when Flash does something where he hides something and it works against a modern pro, you just can't help but be fucking awestruck almost. Like, holy shit, he got away with it. How did he know in that moment to do it? How did he know to do that build at this timing in this series against this pro that knows all of these things. That is so beautiful on so many levels. It gives me goosebumps. Literally gives me fucking goosebumps, man, thinking about it, okay? Literally all my hair is standing up. Holy shit, it just gives me goosebumps. All my fucking pores are open, okay? I get literal goosebumps because this is my whole life. Now, I'm really grateful and I'm very lucky that League of Legends saved my life. I was homeless twice. Came to Korea with nothing. I was living in fucking utter poverty. I was making like no money every month. I, I, I've said before, the amount of money that I earned between 2011 and 2014 was probably less than $10,000 total from StarCraft and like other stuff. And then League of Legends saved my life. Um, because the Nidalee video went on Reddit and it blew up and then the Jace video blew up and I was talking about things that I knew to be true because I had such an edge coming from so many different games at such a high level and RTS players, sorry, literally like every other game except for maybe fighting game lab players, I don't know, sorry, but RTS players just problem solve really fucking good. RTS players are actually just built different when it comes to problem solving. Now it doesn't mean that, you know, mobile players or fighting game players or, you know, shooters, etc. can't problem solve better than an RTS player. But literally, that's the entire environment of RTS is stuff like this. So I get really mad when people say that things are like processes or formulas or theories or, you know, methods are wrong without any real reason. If you tell me just do Baron, no, it's a cop out. It's just, it's just a cop-out, man. It's just a cop-out. It's not real. So then me, back when I had more fire in me, okay, and when I had a lot more flair, I went through and I went through every VOD and tracked the mountain, uh, the, the, the Baron Soul uh, capture by enemy teams. And I said, okay, these champions without mountain can do it like this. These champions with mountain can do it like this. When they disappear into the fog of war, they have fixed movement speed. Because they have fixed movement speed, they disappeared into the fog of war. You don't need vision to know where they are. There is a radius. There is an imaginary radius of where they could be. Where are the minions in the wave? Are the minions coming back in the wave? Are the minions are about to arrive to mid lane? How long do we have if they're bursting Baron? 24 seconds? Okay. Minions are about to arrive in two seconds. We know their movement speed. They disappeared into the fog of war three seconds ago. Based on where they disappeared from the fog of war, the time it takes them to get to Baron has an exact answer too. If that's what they did. If it's an asterisk, which means that we have about 34 seconds from now or something. Okay. Which means minions are about to arrive in mid. Let's cut off three seconds or something, right? Let's go to 31 seconds. We have 31 seconds that they might be on the Baron, right? Okay. The minions are fighting each other. Is anyone showing up? No, a couple more seconds pass. 26 seconds. We're now almost at the point where they'd be starting Baron. 26 seconds. Anyone showing up? No. The minions are dying. That's weird. Hmm. That's weird. That means they have a range. They have a range of options that they're doing. We're not quite at the start of Baron yet, but we're close. Do we have Blue Trinket? We do. How many Blue Trinkets do we have? If you're doing it right, I think you have four. That was one of my claims, was that if you're doing it right, you have four. Why do you have four? Because minion spawn timers are a fixed static thing that is set by Riot Games that neither this team who wants to make a Fog of War play nor your team can control. There's nothing either of you two jackasses can do about it. The same way that there's nothing that this SCV could do 
to know that if he left this fucking mineral node, that he only has a couple of seconds before he would dump it and come back. Okay? This is a set thing by Blizzard the same way that minions are a static set thing by Riot Games. Okay. Blue Trinkets have a cooldown. Blue Trinkets grant sight for X amount of time. Minions are a neutral resource that we can use to further help us make conclusions and come to decisions. Okay, we are going to use a combination of maybe skill shots that have long range, blue trinkets, neutral things like minions that the opponents likely would not forego for no reason, right? They wouldn't just let all the minions in mid die for no reason. They wouldn't just totally disappear and all the minions start dying. So we know all of this. Okay. Do we have a skill shot that can maybe check a brush? Yeah, we do. Okay, let's approach that brush with caution. We know that they're in this jungle, but we don't know exactly where. Who has a skill shot that can check the brush whilst also remaining safe? I do. Okay, check the, check the brush. Are they in that brush? No. Okay. That means that they didn't come to this part of the map. They didn't come to this part of the map, and we know the radius based on their movement speed of where they could be. There's a limited number of places that they could still be hiding. Okay, are they on the Baron yet? They might be, but we don't have to use Blue Trinket yet. They just started it. Okay. Do we have another skill shot that can check another brush? Yeah, I do. Okay, do it. As long as you can remain safe. Check that brush. Are they there? No, they're not there. So they're not in that brush. They're not in this brush. And they're not at the minions. But they did disappear. So now, they're either on Baron or they're recalled. If they recalled, what is the champion's movement speed while factoring in home guard bonus? Champion has X movement speed. That means that the champion will have arrived back into vision or at any of the neutral minion waves at X amount of time. We know this even in the form of minion waves. The minions at bottom and top turret for the first 15 minutes of the game will always arrive in 30 second intervals at 131, 201, sorry, 201, 231, etc. They will pass the turret at these intervals. We can simplify it and say 30s, just, just for people, right? I can just say 230, 130, two minutes, etc. They will pass the turret. We also know how often they spawn. Okay. So because we know all of this, because, because we know all of these things, and we have successfully checked this area, and we have successfully maybe, you know, checked this area. And we know that they're not here, but that their movement speed would mean that maybe with the time that passed, right? Because again, um, you, you have a limited amount of time, etc. Maybe they would be right here, which maybe means that they're not showing yet if your vision radius is just this, right? Because you checked. How Now, next question, as a team of five professional players... What is the time that it takes this champion to enter into this vision? Uh, five seconds. Okay, five seconds. Do we have five seconds to spare before we blow a blue trinket on the Baron? Uh, yeah, we have five seconds to spare. Okay, we're going to wait five seconds. Five seconds pass. Did they show up? No, blue trinket. They're on Baron. Five seconds pass. The enemy team knows that you know this. And they're trying to play guerrilla warfare. So what happened? This champion right here, maybe it's Draven. Maybe, it, you know, may, maybe this champion right here, he knows that you know this because we're evolving as pro players. He knows that you know to check the brushes with safe skills. He knows that you know that it takes, you know, 24 seconds to do the Baron. He knows that you know that the minion movement speed is static and set. He knows that you know that, you know, they have a set movement speed radius and that they can only be in certain locations in the fog of war. He knows all this. He stands still for, for five seconds. Okay, stand still for five seconds. You blow the blue trinket. Ha! Keck, got your blue trinket. Types in all chat to you. And then they, re then they, then they try to re repeat the dance. Then you try to repeat the dance. And then Draven's question keeps becoming, do you have a blue trinket? Do you believe me? Did my bluff work? So... This is all possible. Nothing I'm saying is impossible that I'm discussing. We're talking about static set numbers 
movement speed of various champions that is roughly the same, right? Because most champions in League of Legends, right? They have, you know, 325, 335, 330, 345, etc., right? And then certain champions are really gross and they have like 350 and 355 and stuff, right? So we know that everything is roughly the same, man. Everything's roughly the same. Now, you don't want to know, um, you want to know another really cool thing about uh, range. You know how skill shots have range, right? You know how skill shots have, you know, 2,000 range, 1,500 range, etc. You can take this movement speed number. And I did this with Summit once. I really did do this with Summit once when he told me that the enemy in bottom could get to Baron. Okay? And I remember doing this with Summit once, and I remember, I, I mean, Zven was there. So I did this. Took the champion's movement speed. And we went into something, we went into some app, and we determined the exact range that the enemy champion was from Baron. In, in you know, actual, absolutely exorbitant units, right? Like 10,000 range, uh, 20,000 range, something like that. It's a math problem. Can the movement speed of this champion move to this amount of range in this amount of time? Now that's, that is um, the willingness to fight. That's the willingness to just not accept the answer that the enemy champion can move to Baron. No, I want to know. And I also want to know that I can memorize this spot on the map with a rough approximation, right? I, I, I know that I can, I, can, I can allocate this as B. I can make this like, you know, I, I, I could do this as C, right? Roughly, right? We're trying to get within one or two seconds. One or two seconds is what we're trying to do. We're trying to get as close as we possibly can, right? This is A. Right? This is Z. And I can have all these imaginary bubbles. Now, you don't have to remember all the bubbles at once. You just have to see where are the opponents. And then when you see where the opponents are, you remember that section of bubbles. Now, the map is mirrored, which means that these bubbles will move to this side of the map at the same time as these bubbles will move to this side of the map. Right? This will move the same time as this. So it's actually not a lot of numbers. It's not, a, it's not a lot of things to memorize, right? And even if you want to cram for an exam and memorize these numbers, unless Riot comes in and changes minion movement speed, where there's a very unique champion in the game, like, you know, Hecarim just turbo running it, okay, you're going to have roughly a similar answers. Now, if champions like aforementioned Hecarim and other types of champions are in the game, those are possibly unique to a meta, which means that maybe they are the black sheep amongst the meta in your local region or tournament, which then means that it's even easier to just remember, hey, Hecarim uh, is unique and that he's this much faster. It's only one or two champions, maybe, that, that's in like the meta pool that does it, but it's very easy to just be like, yeah, you know, 80 of these champions do this, these two do this. So, <clears throat> now we move on. And um, well, let's get back to some stuff. So, the, these are all concepts that are very well established in other areas, and it should not mean that these are odd. This is also why I've always said, I can leave the game for a really long time, come back, and it's fine. Right? Um, now, I want to I wanna plug in the variables... But unless Riot does something, these things are always static. Now, the problem is, is that when you get someone that says to you about the Belveth clear, right? 211, 303, uh, you know, 56, et cetera, 600. When you get someone that says it's not, but you have to keep pushing. And that is what I said earlier about my willingness to make the blind see. Um, or I used to use the quote a long time ago, which is a famous quote by Theodore Roosevelt, right? Which is, if you can't make them see the light, make them feel the heat. Um, which I guess would be my equivalency of uh, planting a seed, because even if they can't actually see the light, they can tell that something's warmer. Which if there's a person telling you that there was a light or a source of, you know, sun or something nearby, and you keep telling them, no, there's not, how is that possible if there's heat on you? Obviously, they could have brought a radiator, but, you know, I mean, it's whatever. So, um, all of this is going on. And, uh, okay, so we talked about all of this. These are all processes and, you know, things that we should do. And this is how we talk about draft and how we talk about matchups and itemization and a lot of other stuff. And sometimes what happens when you get two, um, when you get two very smart people um, who happen to disagree? Well, now it comes into, is the conversation going to be had in good faith? And also, 
um, is are, are both parties going to use similar methods? And if one party isn't going to use a similar method to reach a conclusion, they must be able to demonstrate that the other method is logical or that um, it has, you know, it has practical usage that does not just stem from appeal to authorities or uh, emotions um, or appeals to emotion, you know, appeals to emotions. And when I said emotions uh, a second ago, I meant subjective emotions, etc. And all of these other things. And that's what you have to be willing to do. So I'm very confident in the ability to do and have these things if need be. But I don't like doing it anymore because what happens? Um, I'm very heartbroken over the T1 stuff. Um, I did have the option. It, 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 this is all very publicly known. I had the option to be a T1 coach, or, you know, uh, coach T1 strategically. I did have that option. And I did choose to go the streamer route. I did choose to go the streamer route. And they, um, you know, this is also public. Um, it was even said, if I wanted to, maybe I could just join in summer, if that's what I wanted to do. They did really give me that option at the end. And I know that people don't believe that, but me and Joe Marsh are both on record about this. Um, I'm very uh, heartbroken that that didn't happen, but I think not. I think for reasons that people don't get. Um, it's very heartbreaking to be able to sit here, have these conversations, be willing to go into a coliseum about these conversations, be willing to talk about these things. And then you have organizations or people that can witness it or they can observe it and they can they can reach um they can reach objective conclusions on things that are being said and if they detach the personal aspects of it they should be able to realize that the things that i'm saying completely not ab about me but about the methodology is sound and that um the other things are very demonstrable um as well as like other stuff that I've talked about from like various other games and all this other stuff. And it's very odd that the random passerbyer thinks that if the things that I'm saying are accurate, that more people would pay attention. But that's not necessarily true, right? Um, that, that, that literally is not necessarily true because it requires people who know what's being said to evaluate what's being said. Now, again, what happens when you have conflicting professionals about things that are like this with process, processes and methods? Well, you could end up having the higher ups and stuff just say like they can't make an informed opinion um, and thus there's nothing there. That's heartbreaking to me. Um, it's heartbreaking to me that it doesn't seem as valued as I think that it should be from an objective standpoint from how many um how how much everything's been in the open and in the light for so many years and there there's like no dittos um because you, you can't you can copy answers but um if you don't understand the material then uh if, you, if you're given new problems then you can't solve them that's very heartbreaking um so LOL is my whole life and talking about stuff like like LOL games these things are literally my whole life and I'm very grateful and fortunate to be in the position that I am in um, but it still does come with the willingness to get up put on a cam still get flamed by people still um, have completely just random people uh, just make the most insane comments right um, when you know that the comp they haven't even entertained so many things that you've already entertained and you've disregarded um, as an answer. And then to be attacked for your dismissal of it or um, your unwillingness to engage in it because of the time that it takes. And that's really sad. Um, so um, when this is all that I do and I don't, you know, I mean, uh, I made a tweet last year that it felt like everyone who was in my close social circle um, only was in my social because I was LS or I had a lot of money. 
And um, it felt like almost, not all, but almost every relationship was transactional. And I felt like when I started realizing that relationships were transactional, I started responding like that in kind because it just hurts. And um, sometimes I get emotional and I'm an asshole to people. And then I feel bad about it later after a lot of time to ponder and think about it. Um, you know, and I have trouble with, uh, I, 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 I have trouble with uh, separating conversations about this game with my personal life because I don't see it any different. I see um, statements about, I see, um, you know, if someone says that Callista beats Draven and every process or something that I, 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 you know, I use to reach the conclusion that Draven beats Callista, it's not that Callista beats Draven. It's that something that is a part of me, something that I use, that I live by, that I, that I, that I utilize on the day-to-day -day life, that I use to operate as a, as a person is flawed or wrong. And if I feel like the answer that I'm being supplied with isn't sufficient enough, I'm going to get angry. Um, or again, if I feel like the conversation is in, um, bad, uh, bad faith. So, um, there's, there is things where I do get lazy. I stop paying attention to certain things. I miss things. Um, I lose track of things, right? But that doesn't have anything to do with my ability to do the aforementioned things in the event that I'm solely focused on it. Um, hmm. Sad. Anyways, I think, um, I think this was a really long talk on like thought processes and stuff. And I really wanted to establish something very long. I know that this is kind of turned into like podcasty, but it's very sad. It's very sad that so many things are out in the open. Um, and like anything that's published, you know, online or whatever, right? It's always open to criticism and everything like that. But it's worse when no one bothers to figure out why or what. And, um, uh, you know, the Belveth example that I gave you earlier, just imagine everyone just decides that the Belveth guy is fucking nuts um, in the sense that like Belveth can't clear fast, right? Just complete dismissal. Obviously, that's not the case for me anymore. Um, but it, it's sad to me to watch so many things and just feel empty inside um, because it feels like so many things I would do now are for what? what? What am I even doing anymore? I feel like I failed in many ways. Um, now, I don't think I failed in the sense that, like, I got added to the game. I don't think I failed in the sense of, like, um, you know, the C9 stuff or, or whatever, right? With very, very uh, small sample size of games there, right? Uh, the three months I was, I was at C9. Um, I don't think I failed there. I think I failed in that I had beliefs that um, gr uh, things that had nothing to do with me, such as some of the stuff that I'm talking about in this talk tonight, things that have nothing to do with me, but the problem is, is that they're spoken by me, so some people have a problem with disconnecting that it's me saying it versus the substance of what I'm saying. Um, it sucks. Uh, it feels like it was, feels like I failed um, in that regard. And I can keep doing things like, you know, uh, co-streaming and making tier lists and, you know, doing Patreon, doing YouTube and all this other stuff, but what am I really doing anymore? Um... A lot of my friendships, again, it just really feels like um, I'm just either Mr. Moneybags or I'm LS and there's something to gain there. I remember feeling this when I first started getting uh, more popular. There are a lot of people that reach out behind the scenes that I fully believe they have nothing to gain from me. And so I always um, really, really acknowledge that because, again, actions speak louder than words. But there is always that darker side of me and that is there ulterior motives um, is this person actually capable of acknowledging that I believe that they have nothing to gain from me, but that they actually do have something to gain from me? It's just not obvious yet. You know, like I have thoughts like this, talk about it with um, the therapist and stuff. And I feel like a lot of people, um, they, they slander or they negatively talk about my mental health um, without also realizing that my, my work ethic precedes me, precedes me as a reputation, um, my ability to just work endlessly and you know, show up for things and do you know, like sh sh show up for, you know, uh, like three different time zones and fully cast LCK and all this other stuff. And yeah, I feel empty inside. Yeah, I feel depressed because of so many things I'm witnessing around me. I just feel alone. I feel lonely all the time. And um, my anxiety just runs wild because of my thoughts. My thoughts are always racing. I can't silence them. I can't shut them up. Sometimes the, you know, the thoughts get really bad. And um, 
I always value tr uh, like full transparency and stuff. And you guys have always heard me talk very fondly of Joe Marsh. And Joe Marsh has always had the utmost, fullest transparency with me time and time again. And it makes me feel really comfortable. Um, and it you know makes me feel really bad with a lot of stuff that is happening with him and other stuff. So it sucks. It also really sucks um, when people can't discern differences in the scene. People, people can't discern differences between uh, accuracy of um, certain things that might occur or things that happen. And so because they can't do that thing, they think they, they default to titles and credentials and these other types of things because there is a lack of discernment. Um, there's so many things, man. I, I just wish I could keep talking about it. It just makes me really sad. And um, it makes me very upset when I feel like um, this game saved me. I love League of Legends as a community, but a lot of stuff that I'm seeing, and some people would say that me and Dom and Cadrill and Doublelift are directly harming um, competitive esports uh, with like, you know, how we can be negative on stream sometimes and all this other stuff. But I don't, I think that's a very difficult thing to actually know whether or not that's true. It's just like a statement because they correlate the COVID spike and then the decline in viewership with co-streaming also happening at roughly the same time and all this other stuff. Um, it feels really bad um, when when that happens. I just lost my train of thought for the first time. I'm so sorry. Um, uh, what was uh, I just lost my train of thought, man. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, guys. Uh, I just lost my train of thought. Um, oh, it makes me feel really bad when I feel like people are um, actually harming um, community or doing things that uh, confuse uh, people um, or that set things uh, back um, without any sort of actual tangible reason for doing so. Because um, I don't want Lowell to die, obviously, and I've been through two different game deaths now um, in all my years in esports. Two, two game deaths and it sucks um i would love to not just keep co you know i i don't know man i just um i wish i could have done more and i know that i i know objectively um if i just responded or acted in different ways to things that i maybe could have made more ground but it would have been insincere and it would have also um it would have also been very difficult for me to lie or do, you know, whatever without having to like rely on spectacle um, um, or hyperbole and all these other types of things. And I don't know, man, it just it sucks, it really sucks. And um, obviously I have so many, okay, let's stop. Let's stop there. Um, let's get back to the drafts. I feel like I laid a very fleshed out explanation of how to reach conclusions, how to arrive at certain statements and all this other stuff and yada, yada, yada. And again, me being me, if one champion is 51% and the other is 49, just as hyperbole, I'm always just going to sign with 51. Now, sometimes I'll make asterisks and I'll say that, but the person playing the 49 is way better. So I think that they'll win or like things like that. Right. Now, obviously 51, 49 is very gross. That's a, essentially a coin uh, coin flip but when i think that it's not a coin flip when i think it's you know uh 60 60 40 65 35 70 30 um you know uh, th things of that nature then i am going to respond with a lot more passion um in my stance and other things and it's um it's very very frustrating um but also it, it feels really bad to even engage with uh conversations that again either A, are not in good faith, or B, um, is with a person that you cannot have an actual conversation with because they're, um, it's kind of like, um, imagine there's a scientist trying to argue with a flat earther, but the flat earther rejects some of the methods or the approaches of the scientist, which is kind of like calling the scientist a liar, but the flat earther just rejects the methods and has their own methods, but then the scientist rejects that person's methods and I'm just using flat earth scientists as a uh, very good direct uh, comparison because I feel like it's an analogy that a lot of people can understand. I'm not saying that um, people who uh, inherently disagree are flat earthers, although you guys might hear me make snide remarks like, you know, saying, you know, this guy's a flat earther, or, you know, this is flat earth. Um, 
again, for hyperbole and spectacle. Um, but that does not mean that there's a willingness to not engage in um, the conversation there. Anyways. So. T1 lost draft. And, uh, yeah, Lissandra sucks. Okay. Um... All right, so that was game. Uh, that was game two and three. All right, now let's get into game. Let's get into game four draft. Ooh. Also, by the way, I I don't want people to think that I literally believe that you know that like image of the guy that almost finds gold, right? There's the guy here, and he has like a pickaxe. You know, he has like an axe thingy. And he's digging in a cave, and gold is, like, right here. You guys know this? Right? And then he gives up. I don't want people to believe that I always think that I'm going to strike gold. Or that, like, a statement that I'm making is always striking gold. I don't, again, I don't believe the theory is impervious. Right? There's chances there's no gold there. There's actually just no gold there. And I have to alter the, um, the variables or, like, the, 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 the formula. I, I have to alter things. Um, but I can't do that without seeing an abundance of failures that didn't work and why they didn't work first after uh, trying a, a lot of different hypotheses. I um, can't even talk, man. I'm losing my voice. Um, okay, let's make this draft. So Renata... Why is it? Why does she not? I don't know. That's weird. Uh, what was it? Renata, uh, Renata, Lucian, Callista by T1. And again, I don't think any of these. Oh, my voice, my voice, and I'm fatigued at this point. Uh, Renata, Callista, Lucian, and now we have Ari. Uh, Ari, Siver, Renekton. Okay. Okay. Ari Server Renekton. Um, and then we have B1 Azir. Now, I already think that B1 Azir. Now, if you can flex him, which I'm not even going to say that maybe these two teams can't because we've already seen uh, Dom1 actually flex him. Um, if you can flex him, maybe this is a little bit better um, because some of the matchups that he ends up having. But Azir is still a very specific type of champion to open with that leaves you immediately susceptible to getting layered inside of the draft phase. Oh, also, this is um, this is T1 now, and uh, this is Dom1. Uh, my music just stopped, too. That's not good. So, um, Azir, obviously, very good versus hard engage comps, very good versus mid rangey comps, not good versus, um, you know, uh, th things that have ways to get around you or get on top of you without you having any say. So, obviously, like, certain assassins um, or uh, true control champions, champions that have longer range than him, that also terrain control, um, or that just have a lot more range than Azir. Um, these types of champions make it very difficult for Azir um, to, to function, and it means that he's going to have to itemize in a certain way that he doesn't want to itemize in. Now, the enemy, now, uh, Damwon, they actually choose, uh, Wukong and Yumi. Now, again, I already think this is immediately bad. Um, reason that I think this is, uh, really bad here, uh, is because, again, you could vacuum answer, uh, the Wukong with Udir, slap the monkey, and then you could also take Sona. Um, to answer the Yumi. Now, Sona will never get banned in the LCK. So what you could do is you could do something like you could choose, you know, Senna. Um, it would be like one option that, you, you know, you could, you could end up taking. Um, I mean, you just choose any AD carry, really. Um, that's going to end up going with, uh, that's going to end up going with, um, Senna. Um, I mean, you could, uh, again, I mean, I guess, I guess you would, you would want some sort of like lane control, lane priority, uh, you know, stuff, um, of some nature. It's too early to pick like Zaya or anything like that. Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to recommend like, or I'm not going to advise, um, picking Zaya. It's also too early, um, to pick something like Aphelios because even if you do have Sona, um, and then you have Aphelios and Azir, they both lose to the same exact theme and then Udyr isn't, isn't going to be very happy. Um, so because Senna is very good at the theme that beats Azir, and we know that we have a lot of options for uh, Senna friends, and Senna is perfectly happy um, playing the game with Sona and everything, um, I, I, I feel pretty fine in saying that like we could just Senna here. Now, outside of Udir, um, there, I mean, there's other junglers that you could pick if you really don't want to 
um, do Udir or something like that. Um, but obviously Udir is is really, 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 really strong. Gwen isn't banned uh, this time around, so if you wanted to do something with Gwen, but then you wouldn't want to have Azir um, inside of the jungle, you would want to have an enchanter in mid lane uh, like Ivern or, or something of that nature. Um, and, and things just get a little bit weird here, right? So. Um, I think Senna is actually fine because she's a flex, um, and I think that like Udir or Trundle are, are both probably fine here. Um, I also think it's probably early enough to also just go Shivana um, at, at this stage of the game um, because, you, again, you have so many options down in bot lane. Shivana has a flex potency up into top lane, um, so we could maybe we could maybe find some good matchups there. But um, for, for sake of the argument, I, I would just say that it's Udir, um, Shivana, Trundle, um, some, something of that nature, something that's already just going to uh, beat Wukong and, and make stuff uh, very, very very unfun for him. I don't think that um, any of the AP junglers like Evelyn or something uh, is the best way. You don't have enough uh, information yet, and I don't think that you have to do this when you already get a hold of uh, Senna and you know that you're going to have Stoner or something. I think it's just a lot better to make um, a Death Ball-y comp that is just ultimately doing what they do, but better, and you already have a Zier for it. So um, that's why I would, I would say that Udir here um, is probably really good, but obviously no one plays Udir. So that would be um, one of one of my uh, possible suggestions. And again, it comes down to how do you want to play the game? What is your opponent's ranges uh, for champion picks? What are they likely to pick in response to this? And then we keep narrowing and keep refining, and then you know we reach better conclusions, um, assuming that you're able to play this. T1 end up doing something that I think is really, really dumb. They end up picking uh, Nila is not here. So I'm going to use um, Nico for Nila. Um, I'm going to use Nico for Nila. And they pick Vi into Wukong, and now they have Nila and they have Vi into Yumi. And now, all of a sudden, you're forcing Azir to go along for the ride, which now means that he's going to have to be a burst in type of engage Azir, which I do not think is his best way of playing. It doesn't mean that he's imp it's impossible to play him in that way. It just means that that is not his favorite archetype that he would like to play with. And I don't understand the reason for really doing this when now you give the opponents the opportunity to also try to death ball. Now, if the opponents also try to death ball, maybe you get access to like Tarek or something you put, you know, and then uh, Vi goes full lethal and uh, Tarek puts, you know, Bastion on her and Vi goes in and you have Tarek-y and you have tarek R and stuff, right? Vi ultimate lands on the carry and then, like, as Vi is about to connect, you channel the E and as the carry lands too, they get stunned by Tarek and, you know, stuff stuff like this would probably be something that's fine with Neela. I just don't think it's the best way to go about it. Um, Dom Juan end up responding with, I think, again, really not great ideal champion here, which is the Silas. So it is sort of death balling, but the enemy team, I mean, Silas has like some ultimates, but like why? Why Why are we picking Silas in this particular instance? Um, it, Azir now is going to go Oblivion Orb, and because he's going to go Oblivion Orb, um, and then he's going to be in all the other fights, it also means that your Yumi is going to get a little bit less value. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, um, the, the Silas here on R3. When we move into the ban phase, what ends up happening is Damwon bans, what does Damwon ban? Dom Juan bans uh, Dom Juan bans Nautilus, which is a useless ban because again there there's so many there's so many supports that this is so useless. You have to try to narrow a theme, but it, it's almost like bans just don't even matter here. The enemy now bans Zaya, uh, or sorry, T1 bans Zaya. And if you guys heard me talk about in like the last draft video that was uploaded. Um, about how obvious it is to read certain things going on off of like isolated champion bans, then you, you would also know that like Zaya um, being banned away here signifies that yes, they are going to go balls to the wall hard engage into you. Um, I don't understand uh, why, you know, this would be like the logic. I guess they don't want to go against Zaya. It's not even that Zaya is like necessarily a bad champion because T1 are doing this, but T1 has left themselves with no option, um, I think, at this point in the draft um, to play around it. Gwen, another champion that's a amazing at stand your ground um, and just destroying uh, enemy champions. So Pike and Al ends up getting banned um, as well. So at this point, they also end up going Zeri. Now, right here, Gnosis is not really... I don't. I, I genuinely don't think Gnosis is an option at this point as a support champion against Zeri. Um, I, I just don't think that it's going to be viable enough at this point. Now, they are also deathballing, and Zeri is very, very, very quick. Um, so they are deathballing, and again, there's the option that I talked about where maybe you could just try to deathball, but then likewise... I mean, uh, what is the interaction on Silas and Tarek? Are, are, does, does Silas only get it for himself? Is that is that what happens? Um, or can you give it to the teammates that are also connected to him when he R's? Um, 
Tar Tarek with Nila is probably her best combo, um, no matter what. Um, I think that like this is an option, and then obviously you need to choose another Death Bally champion. Um, so they would they would end up going with the Blind Camille, and I think that when they go with Blind Camille here uh, against this team composition, I don't even know what I would say is like Trindamir actually just like best here. This is very rough. Um, I think that things are like super super unwell here. Um, obviously for the for the T1 team composition, I think things here are really brutal. Um, maybe if Trindamir comes in on, on R5 and Trindamir um, is almost like unnerfed with uh, some of the changes that have ended up uh, happening to him um, over the, the last couple of patches uh, where he ended up getting nerfed from his current state inside of Spring. So I think all of this uh, is a little bit frightening. Um, this is obviously rough for Camille, but it doesn't even matter because what happens is, is they actually do... Oh, right here. They actually do go with Camille and Sejuani. Um, so when Zeri gets picked, they pick Sejuani and they pick Camille. This allows Camille to go support, but if she goes support, she's only going to have one item. She's only going to have Hextech Ultimatum, um, and then Sejuani would go top lane. That's less valuable than Sejuani just being a little bit less in levels, but Camille having extra items, um, more scaling, more split you know, split push potentially, even though split push isn't really real, um, and then possibly better matchup. So at least you entertain that flex is a possibility here. But the thing I don't like about this is, again, uh, well, one, you just gave Silas another good ultimate, but you are deathballing onto a team composition that already was sort of losing into you if you just kited them back and vacuum answered some of their champions. So it doesn't make any sense. It's very, very frustrating. It's very annoying. Um why why uh why they're doing this right um and then obviously the the last response here uh ends up being yone by damwon um now yone by damwon um you know th i think this is uh to make it so that camille has to go top lane um yone versus sejuani would definitely be a lot better um, and then Camille would have less value. So now Camille is going to have to end up going top lane against Damwon. But what ends up happening here is, again, um, we can predict that certain items uh, will be purchased. Uh, Azir will be stunted 800 gold because of the Oblivion Orb purchase against Silas in laning phase. Um, Sejuani support, her items are going to cost more than Yumi's, in addition to the fact that Sejuani needs to get boots. What this essentially means is that Yumi is cheating a lot of gold because she doesn't have to buy any boots and her items are cheaper, which now means that when Sejuani's at one item, even if nothing's happened, Yumi is at 1.5 or more. Because all of Yumi's items are really cheap, um, because you have Moonstone at 2,500 and then you have the Enchanter items at 2,300, if Yumi also has like Futures Market or something like that, it's very, very broken. And Yumi isn't going to need as many, you know, control wards as like the Sejuani is, um, just because again, the natures of the two team compositions, Yumi's going to function a lot better on lower economy, which now means that Yumi is going to be a lot better than the counterpart Sejuani in the later stages. Um, so Azir is going to be naturally stunted because the item that he's forced to build. Uh, at, at this point, also, we know that Zeri in you know, super late stages of the game, Yone at super late stages of the game, Yumi at super late stages of the game, they're going to be a lot better than their counterparts inside of this game. Some people might argue uh, about like Camille or something, um, but for, for the most part, I think I think most people would agree on this. Now, again, because both parties are just death balling, what it ends up meaning is that Wukong Cyclone actually has value because both parties are, are, are death balling and neither party really has enchanter outside of Yumi. Um, now, what does this mean? Well, it means that if T1 launch an offensive into Damwon, Cyclone defensive is actually a really good disruption. Cyclone, likewise, offensively with Yumi and Stealth or to follow up on Tiasuo is really good offensively too. So Wukong gets both ends of the stick here. He can both be offensive and defensive for his team. He has a lot of value just in, in terms of how he's going to function in this game. It's assumed as well that Vi is likely going to go for like the Kempunk and, and tanky type of Vi build, which is what they're all doing, which I think is really bad. Because what you need to do here is basically just take out Zeri or Yone, because the sustained damage in these team fights by these two champions is extremely high once the game gets going late enough. Now again, T1 isn't really losing super hard until we're talking about four items. Four items is typically, in League of Legends, uh, assuming even game states and stuff, the uh, time in the game where utility items start to come in. For Yone, sometimes it comes in at three items, depending on how the game's going. For uh, also Zeri, sometimes she goes for a utility item at three items as well, again, depending on how the game's going. And we know that Yumi should have Moonstone and that Zeri should have Shield Bow, so this is a lot of damage to chew through. Because Yumi and Zeri are, uh, you know, Zeri's gonna have Shield Bow, uh, Zeri should also have uh, Bloodthirster, um, I think, just to survive as much, and then Yumi should have Moonstone. Um, you know, or Zeri's gonna have Bloodthirster at some point. It means that there's a lot of damage that has to be chewed through, which means Sejuani 
Sejuani has to go AP, which is how we can, you know, know that Sejuani's items are going to cost more than Yumi's. But by going AP, at least Sejuani isn't useless as she's at 1.5 items. Whereas if Sejuani goes tank Sejuani, when she gets to one item, she is effectively the same champion for the remainder of the game. None of her abilities get anything. It doesn't matter that she's slightly tankier by one or two auto attacks by the carries late game or something. It doesn't actually equate to anything. Whereas the AP damage, the little bit of extra burst, possibly killing Yumi in a displacement, or just adding that little bit of extra burst to kill one of the Yumi hosts um, inside of a team fight can actually possibly be valuable. So we know all of this stuff about itemization. We know the gold cost of uh, a lot of these items. We know how a lot of these lanes are actually going to go, assuming evenly skilled players and that both players respect what each other can do inside of the lane. Obviously, this doesn't always happen, right? Because again, ace king versus ace queen, sometimes the king loses. Sometimes variables occur where the, the queen wins. Sometimes the queen doesn't even get a queen. Sometimes the queen actually gets a king, and then she gets a jack, and then she gets a 10 and then the king doesn't get a queen, and the queen player walks away with a straight. This would be like something absolutely unholy, like the one in, you know, the, the, the one in 10 games that uh, a team comp that's getting really outscaled uh, gets a soul, and um, it, it undoes the soul. Like, um, there, were, there were a couple of games, right, where you guys remember, the team had Elder and Soul and Baron and stuff, and they lost fights. Those would be really gross examples where, like, things that happened that shouldn't have still even wasn't enough, and yeah. So, um, the, all of that stuff is, is going on. Um, we talked about Silas's items inside of the game. Um, the Crown of the Shattered Queen on Silas was a little bit weird uh, just because of the way that it can be popped off even before a fight happens. But obviously, if he takes the fight on his terms, he might get value out of Crown of the Shattered Queen. Crown of the Shattered Queen on Azir is really bad because Yumi just has long range, Zeri with her W, and even um, you know Silas's Q, depending on how the standoff is going with Silas' ability uh, to, to dash backwards or whatever. Whatever. There's a good chance that Faker's Crown actually won't have a lot of practical value. And also, Azir's role inside of this game is actually to assist with the burst. So, on Twitter, I made the, um, I, I made the hypothesis that, um, you know, I cannot see how they would win if they play a standard game and they build the items that I think that they're going to build. So I made the suggestions that instead of building the items that I think that they should build, I feel like Vi should have gone lethality inside of the game so that the, you know, the amount of time that other champions have to spend killing the Yumi host or whatever is possibly lower um, and that Vi should go glass cannon. Uh, and, you know, I thought that Sejuani should go AP so that her pick potential would be higher. I thought uh, Azir should go nuker build um, so that he could follow up on things because again, this team comp flourishes and extended fights if your burst if your if your damage dealt is very high out the gate it's hard for yumi to win the sustained fight if you're building all defensive items and you're building you know sustain items and all these other things the fights are going to be longer and when the fights are longer your yumi is going to flourish even if you have grievous wounds and obviously the abilities um of the Dom Juan champions are going to be a lot better. And so I felt like uh, on Twitter, I ended up doing the um, the post where I went down uh, the list of a lot of their items and why I felt like it didn't make sense and why it didn't make sense even for the curving of the game um, and how even on a fundamental uh, level, if like Zeus believes that like the, um, you know, the Frozen Heart has a lot of value here because of the attack speed uh, reduction and everything, the armor actually doesn't have as much value because of who the enemy champions are. So the item actually isn't what it appears to be because of the dynamic of the game. We talked about like, you know, the hole breaker and everything else. So I feel like this is a this is this is very bad for T1 and I feel like the way that they played the game the way that they itemized the game I thought it was very bad I thought that some stuff was really cool inside of it like Faker not getting boots uh, for a really really long time um, I thought that was really cool I thought that was actually smart because of his function as a siege cannon um, in a lot of the uh, 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 like the the early mid transition etc so I think all of this is um, I think this is okay um, so, okay, we talked about that draft. Obviously, I already talked lightly on uh, variations that would, would be a little bit different. Um, obviously, I already think that T1 is losing on B2, B3. Well, I don't like B1 either, um, but when uh, enemy responds R1, R2, I do think that there's a, there's a chance to get the edge in the draft here. Um, so you have to change uh, the B2 and the B3. Um, and I've already suggested some of the options to changing the B2, B3. So I think in that regard, it's fine. Um, so we've already talked about stuff like that. B, uh, D B1s would obviously be a very different. We're not about to run through a ton of different B1s. We're just going to go into um, the next game. So um, let, let's move into uh, let's move into the. Oh, that's right. This video doesn't work. Okay, let's move into the next game. Let's move into the next uh, game. Oh, game five. Okay. Where's the draft? Where's the draft? So I actually didn't see the draft because I was. Uh, what was I? Was I on the bathroom or what? I can't actually remember. Okay. Okay, dinger. Okay. So let's clear all this out. Okay. 
Let's clear all this out. And so T1 are on uh, blue again, same bands. And enemy is also same bands. And we've already talked about the bands many, many times. And now T1 open with uh, T1 open with B1 Wukong. Sorry. T1 opens with B1 Wukong. Again, don't like it. Forces your hand. Doesn't have many options. Requires opponents to blunder and draft. There's many junglers that are a lot better that people just don't play. Uh, you know, and, and so I just feel like it, 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 it's a very big mistake. Um, so now, uh, Damwon is already beginning to actually layer them in the draft. Um, Azir, dual flex, Poppy is also flexible, and both of these are very well positioned um, against Wukong, depending on how the comp is going to develop. Poppy stifles a lot of other types of, like, friendly Wukong champions that would typically be in the team composition. So, we move on, and now we get Zeri, and we get Yumi. Now, I do not think that uh, these are actually that great of options. It's already a physical damage champion in the sense of Poppy here. Um, Draven isn't banned away. We could do something like Draven, and then obviously Gnosis is never getting banned. We could get access to Gnosis, um, and that would be a very, very scary bot lane for the opponents to deal with. Um, Senna, however, is open, um, so we could just choose Senna, um, and I think that choosing Senna or something would be totally fine in a situation like this. I do not think that we have options at uh, this point of the draft to do something that I also think is very good. Um, which is like Lux Seraphine or something because we have the Azir. So because we have the Azir, the comp is already kind of like scuffed. We also have the Poppy who might be forced to move top lane if you want to get access to like a lot of very good Lux uh, Seraphine uh, champions. Um, so uh, we know that Sona is not going to be banned. Uh, and so because we know that Sona is not going to be banned, we could just do something like take Senna right now. Um, and again, we are going to ball. We are going to death ball. And that is going to be the way that we are going to play this game. Now, you could also death ball um, with like Draven or something to make them, you know, target some other uh, some other champions, um, and then that would. <clears throat> That would be an option. Now, if you choose something like Zaya, I wouldn't say it's like the end of the world here because you know that this team is kind of forced to go in um, at this point. You could also do something like Aphilios and then get access to Sona. Um, that would definitely be good if you if you believe that the opponent's range is just to double down on everything. But I think Senna is definitely a lot more uh, malleable inside of the draft phase. Uh, an alternative here would be to choose you know uh, you know a top laner or something, but then that would end up revealing Poppy um, if you do choose a top laner here. Uh, but again, we don't want to show Senna or we don't want to show um, we don't want to show Senna right now um, because then they'll target some of the ads and we know that Senna is not a champion that or, or Sona is a, not going to be a champion that gets banned. If we pick the Senna, they'll ban Senna allies, and then because they ban Senna allies, we can now safely pick the Sona, and now we have our Poppy or our Azir flexing top lane, um, depending on what the matchups are, so that we can get a very good advantage on our five, and we are already thematically preparing to answer them because we we're currently thematically answering them. So. All of this considered, uh, th th this is all fine. Again, Azir is sort of a thorn in our side. Um, th th there would definitely be better options, or like if Poppy or Azir wasn't there, then maybe some of our R3 options um, get a little bit changed. But anyways, this is not how it played. So let's talk about how it played. So what ended up happening here... Ooh, so what ended up happening here is they went Yasuo. So now Yasuo opens up Poppy to top lane, Diana inside, uh, or sorry, uh, Poppy to support, or Yasuo to ADC um, with a support, or Yasuo Poppy bot lane, but that's probably very unlikely. Um, Azir still does retain his flex. Yasuo could be mid, he could be top, he could be ADC. Uh, he's definitely not going to be jungle. Um, so that's what Yasuo does. Um, now Azir would obviously have to be like, uh, he would have to go top lane, or he'd have to be like uh, mid lane, and Poppy would have to go support for Diana um, to be brought in or something like that which is very unlikely. So what ends up happening here is uh, the ban the ban ends up going Silas. So Silas, uh, don't totally understand why Silas um, would be getting banned away here. Um, I feel like they should actually like Silas to, to come in. Um, I feel like Silas would actually be a pretty bad pairing. And then you get dual value as Dom one because we already talked about Azir with the Oblivion Orb and everything. They already have a Yumi. And if they take a Silas, then you get a lot of value there, which then means that your jungler or other champions don't have to build the Mortal Reminder or anything. Um, and then with the, the way that the, the mid-jungle matchup is, uh, th things can definitely be played around so um the silas the silas is a little bit weird silas ban not so great um and then enemy bans nautilus again useless ban um for the reasons that we've already gone over and then t1 uh ends up banning uh sejuani and sejuani also does not make sense um as a ban uh there's too many things that are open uh the champions for t1 if they play very well um should actually implore dom or uh, sorry dom one bans uh I, i'm i'm misspeaking dom one bans sejuani um, and uh, I don't think that's a very good ban uh, for the reasons that we've already listed. 
So T1 now ends up banning Yone, the Wind Brothers. The Yone thing is a little bit weird, um, but the reason that they do it is because if Yone is picked here, you actually don't have an idea of what's going on um, entirely yet. Um, Yone could be mid, he could be top, um, but in the event that this would be happening, it would mean that Yasuo was actually down in bottom lane, and you still don't know what Yasuo's support is going to be, and there's a lot of supports open. Um, so maybe that's just what they don't want to deal with. Um, in a situation like that. Um, so they ban away the Yone, and then on R4, uh, on R4, oops, sorry, I gotta do that. On R4, what ends up happening is they pick Senna. And again, technically, they're still not revealing a lot. Uh, or, well, in theory, they're not revealing a whole lot. But it's likely going to be Senna Yasuo, and you know that um, you're getting counterpicked top lane. But Azir is currently a flex, as is Poppy. Um, so, you know, depending on what you pick top lane, Poppy could go top lane. Um, so if you pick, like, Aurelia or something, Poppy's just going to go top lane. If you pick Jax, Poppy's going to go top lane. All these other types of things. So a lot of dash champions, Poppy has the option to go top, Azir stays in mid lane, and then you get they get access to a new jungler, um, which would then open up actually the possibility for Yasuo, Senna, bot lane, and then Diana coming in on R5 or something. Um, and that would that would be a combo that I guess they could uh, deal with. So Senna gets picked, and then what T1 does is, despite the enemy team having a really good death ball, and despite the enemy team having the Senna, they choose a Galio that only has the ability to go into mid lane, and then they choose the Nar blind. And I feel like at this point, if they actually, I mean, so they're not gonna, so not, they're not gonna do, so what this does is it prevents the Diana on R5 because Poppy is not gonna be sent up against Nar. Um, Poppy could maybe go in mid lane against Galio, but then she just has no prio ever, so I don't think that that's gonna happen either. Uh, they're not gonna do something like Senna Diana um, down in bot lane. That's just not a real possibility. So I think that maybe, oh, I don't think that T1's thinking that Nar is uh, preventing the Poppy flex to top. I do not think that's what's going on. But what I don't like is that they drafted head first into a Dom Juan death ball comp and they left themselves really susceptible and Dom Juan actually found a really nice answer um, in the Heimerdinger on R5. So now Dom Juan outranges T1. They outscale T1 in team fights way later, right? Now we know um, that Senna uh, should have, what is it? Five souls a minute. Um, five souls a minute is the equivalency of 10 CS a minute, right? So Senna should be at 100 souls at 20 minutes. And then she should be at, you know, 40 minutes into the game or something. Um, she should be at 200 souls or something. Center should be absolutely berserk. Heimer at max rank on his W has seven seconds uh, on uh, his cooldown, but he's going to have ability haste. So if he has Leandre's and he gets access to Oblivion Orb, which uh, Azir no longer has to buy, it means that Heimer has permanent uptime on his Leandre uh, Oblivion Orb uh, debuff onto the Yumi Champion, which means that um, T1 cannot win a War of Attrition against uh, Senna and Heimerdinger. Um, Yumi cannot uh, deal with everything. The other thing about this is that Yasuo, um, once, he's, once we start getting to like four items, the utility items um, for these champions, once they start getting the, the, the utility items, the resists and stuff like that, the team fights become very difficult for T1 because a lot of these champions outside of Zeri only really go to two items. You're going to have Galio with Azanias, and you're going to have Galio with one main item. And after that, he's not going to be doing really a whole lot. Nar, likewise, is going to maybe go to two or three items or something. But what does that really mean in the whole grand scheme of things? Poppy can also function on lower economy than the Wukong can due to the nature of all of these things. So because of the bot lane matchup, it should actually mean that Dom Juan gets, or the bot and the mid lane matchup, it should mean that Dom Juan actually gets a lot of the early dragons. So it's very difficult to say that T1 can just rush Soul before the game would actually get late enough for Yasuo, Senna, and Heimerdinger to reliably just come online and, um, you know, do whatever it is that they want to do um, and, and then win, uh, win, win from, from that way. So with that being considered, um, it's a very Doom situation. Um, so if you know that the opponent is going to get a lot of the early dragons, then it means that you're not getting them, which means that the game naturally should go longer. If the game naturally should go longer, then we should start beginning to have real conversations about, um, you know, third item, fourth item, fifth item, etc. And barring, like, you know, really unfortunate circumstances or events, um, Dom Juan is ahead, right? It uh, doesn't mean that they won't lose, doesn't mean they're impervious and stuff, but they are ahead. And that's all that it matters is that as long as they just go even, as long as, long as the early game tra uh, you know, transforms the way that it should or that it's likely to because of these uh, dynamics and um, th there hasn't been a lot shown otherwise um, to deviate from a lot of these lane phases, etc. in our beliefs... Um, and it should mean that Dom 1 has uh, better, better, better breakpoints than T1. So 
Um, all of this stuff is really, really important, and it's it's stuff that is really important to consider um, when, when like looking at the draft. And again, this is happening in game five here. And I mean, this, this might just be an emotional comment, but typically, I mean, I feel like um, the longer a series draws on, the safer players get. Um, but again, I mean, that's just uh, speculate, uh, you know, it's speculation. We have no way of actually knowing um, if they would just start playing a lot safer. Now, when we actually get into the game, there's a lot of things that look really questionable um, in terms of decisions. And when we're at various game points uh, inside of this game, you'll also notice that the itemization um, on some of the champions is also a little bit weird, but in some areas is actually good. Nar has the Trinity Force, um, and everything's good in that department. Yumi has the Shirelias um, on Yumi. She also has Inspiration Tree instead of Resolve Tree um, on Yumi in this particular game, which also feels a little bit bad. Um, Galio is building Zanya second, but we already knew that Galio is building Zanya second, and now Wukong is building towards Magic Resist, which is really going to only set them up temporarily for mid game um, against, you know, Heimer and Azir um, and whatnot. Populous has Frostfire when she should actually be concerned with damage, I think, more than just like tanking um, because Senna is like there. She has Windwall um, and she has four carry threats on her team. I don't think that she needs Frostfire for the little bit of extra resistances and stuff. So um, the other thing here is that we are at 20 minutes and I believe at this time Senna has what, 37 souls or something? She is really, really, really low on souls. Hold on. Oh, I'm sorry, not 37, 53. She's really, really low on souls. Senna's supposed to be at 100, and she is currently at 53, and she just picked up some of them. So Senna is very far behind pace. Heimer is actually going Zanya's um, second. Now, normally I would criticize Zanya's second, um, and you know I've already talked about why and whatnot, but the way that this game is curving and their ability to get soul and stuff, um, it does look like this... this prohibits anything that T1 would be able to do. Um, and so, you know, we continue we continue to move on. So we continue to move on inside of the game. Um, a lot of people might not remember that this ended up happening here. So the bone plating gets taken off there and owner ends up getting a massive steal. And this steal is really big because it would have put Dom1 at sole point. It also would have extended the game at least another five and a half minutes or something for T1, who would inevitably get the soul inside of this game. So um, T1 ends up uh, winning the dragon. And that ends up happening. And then Dom Juan, you know, we continue into a stalemate. And there's not really a lot that either team can do. Neither team can really siege outside of Dom Juan, but Heimer's not super big yet. And so we're just in a kind of like shoving back and forth lane phase um, with, with a lot of the champions. Um, and you see both, you know, all the turrets are still up for Dom Juan because, again, we knew how the lanes would go. It's, it's very difficult um, for, for T1 to actually get anything going in, in a lot of the lanes and literally nothing has happened i like the stopwatches all being built um and them just having all the stopwatches because it means you know had they gotten that soul or had they gotten that dragon this would have probably been an anticipation for the next dragon which would have been soul which would have been just game ending um because obviously once don one gets it 93 percent chance to win <clears throat> um but now as it is um, Zeri has a uh, shield bow, Phantom Dancer, that's nice. Um, one blue trinket, etc. call completed. Gumiyushi gets out of here. Gumiyushi actually manages to live here. Faker comes in. This didn't need to happen. Yes, they could have killed Gumiyushi, but this fight doesn't need to happen. It's a total standoff right now, but this was very, very big for T1. This is huge for T1 because it gives them a lot of breathing room and the time that, you know, the, the investment that Dom Juan committed to it and whatnot. This fight is a little bit sad. They don't end up getting the Baron, but this is actually really scary by Dom Juan. They kind of have to do this because this Baron would persist into the next dragon, which means T1 would then capture it and get on soul point. And also Dom Juan has all of the tier one turrets still remaining. All of them. This is not just a Baron, uh, 1,500 gold, and then, you know, the 1,400 EXP. This is not what this is. That is not just 1,500 gold, 1,400 EXP. This is literally all of the Tier 1 turrets falling as well. This is thousands of gold that is not reflected in just the immediate capture of the Baron, even with T1 being forced to recall immediately. So, um, this happens. And uh, Don Juan does manage to resist, and it's actually really close. Um, I, I do think if Yumi had Moonstone prior or leading up to this fight, she would have been able to be on different targets. Obviously, the Shirelias actually did not play a, play, uh, 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 a part in either of these two fights that just transpired before our eyes. Um, so had she had Moonstone, I mean, you could always say, like, what, you know, like, what, what about other things that maybe would have been different inside of the game? I understand that. Um, but the, 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 the claim that I'm making is that Don Juan would act the same way if uh, Yumi had Moonstone or not. Um, and so it, it's an interesting thing to um, consider. Consider. Okay, we move forward here um, inside of the game, and now T1 
um, are able to get another Cloud Dragon, thus putting themselves at Soul Point. Um, now that they're at Soul Point, and again, Hymer still, even though he has Leandres, has not purchased an Oblivion Orb. Instead, he's gone for a Nuker build. Now, it doesn't make sense to go for a Nuker build when Senna is going for a low economy build that is very restrictive of vision. And if Senna was actually farming Souls well, which she's not, she's at 83 at 3130. She's at 83. In the last 11 minutes, she has gotten less, th oh, she's gotten 30 Souls in the last 11 minutes. 30 okay if senna had the right build and or, 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 if senna was farming souls correctly and heimer had an oblivion orb and you do war of attrition and poppy has better items this game looks very different in team fights with uh the balling but also the way that you can play the pre-team fights with poke with that combo on you know uh level 13 heimer um uh, ability haste on his items and then leandry plus uh oblivion orb can make it very annoying for yumi um, now, interestingly, Yumi gets uh, Staff of Flowing Water. There is AP ratios on Nar. I believe that he has them on his W and his R. And I'm not sure about Wukong. I think he has AP ratio on his on his clone, but I could be wrong. Um, Zeri obviously has AP ratios. Galio has AP ratios. It's a very good item to have bought. It's a very, 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 very good item um, to have bought. So that that is a good thing. It's just unfortunate there's not Moonstone there, um, you know, so that the item could actually have even more strength. T1 does something um, that is a little bit, uh, you know, uh, T1 has three minutes until the Cloud Soul is going to end up coming up. They charge forward here. They're, they're, you know, they're posturing for a fight. They're looking for the fight. Look at Yasuo up in top lane and look at the bottom lane. Now, they end up getting the turret. But the question ends up becoming, do they actually lose more gold and EXP in the side lanes than they actually gained in the mid-tier one turret? And I think the answer is actually yes. I, I wholeheartedly do believe um, that the answer is yes. Because you've got to understand, each player on T1 just got 100 gold, so that's 500 gold, right? Um, and with the minions that are dying down in uh, top and bot lane that are just going into the void, I believe that the number is greater than 500 and the EXP that you also consider uh, that T1 sharing. Dom1 are also sharing it too, but it's uh, Yasuo did get some of the EXP and the gold up in top lane. Um, so in that regard, I, I do think that this is more beneficial for Dom1. People make the claim about the tier 1 turret and the vision that it grants and everything. It's not real. Uh, I just talked way about that earlier, but like StarCraft and whatnot. Uh, deductive reasoning, um, vision, and fog of war, and everything like that. Uh, it's just a point that League of Legends has to get to. Um, and then this is the miracle. So Dom won't actually seem indecisive here. Now, all of them do have flash except for Azir, but Azir could always get over the wall. In fact, he is already over the wall, right? So Azir is just using his sand shoulders over the wall. Technically, they all have flash, but the question is that they want to use flash right before the dragon's coming up. If they all flash out the back, they have the Baron buff, they would have to be saying that the Baron stats is actually greater than them having flash at the Elder Soul fight. Given the fact that they're actually playing a War of Attrition and they're death balling, maybe it's not actually that bad, but it does seem like they actually don't know how they want to play the Baron. Because um, they would definitely be able to uh, get the Baron back off, get the EXP, get the gold, etc. And then um, Faker uh, not able to get Showmaker when he's closer. And then right here, Karyo with the Iron Man, uh, the Iron Man snap versus Thanos um, ends up stealing the Baron. And then they end up flashing all out anyway. So this was a decision that they're obviously willing to do in the event that they lose the Baron. But it's not a decision that they're willing to make in their indecisiveness leading up to the capture of the Baron. And I think that's where there, you know, there's, there's some uh, problems that end up existing. So we move forward now at this point and what ends up happening? We, we, we just see the itemization on a lot of the champions. Now, the current way that the game goes, right? T1 ends up getting the Cloud Soul. And the itemization on a lot of the champions ends up uh, paying off with the, the defensive measures as well as how much Dom1 has lacked up until this point. Now, we're reaching like, you know, we're going to be turning into the four item spikes soon. This is where these defensive items that T1 bought preemptively would then end up running into other problems, um, you know, with, with, with Dinger um, and whatnot, uh, when he would start actually getting like his pen items and whatnot. Uh, if you itemize for utility early on in order to curve the game a lot better. Um, also, Poppy, uh, Pop Poppy's uh, stuff is, again, we've already talked about it. It's a little bit weird. And so now the tankiness and the Baron buff, poke comps, War of Attrition comps, they're really, really bad against Baron. It's why Ezreal Zoe, every single time you saw it in competitive, um, you would see that when the enemy team would get Baron, Ezreal Zoe would just completely crumble um, and fall apart in front of their eyes. Um, and right now, T1, they have the Cloud Soul, and Senna is very, very underfed. 
Um, Sen is very starved in this game. Heimerdinger, likewise, uh, with the way that he ended up itemizing, it did not pay off. So in, in, in a weird way, T1's itemization for defensiveness and then Heimerdinger's willingness to itemize defensive early, which should have actually been good for the game state, and T1's willingness to itemize defensively should have been bad for the game state, ended up actually flipping. And then because they made the choices that they did in a weird turn of events, it ends up benefiting T1 in this particular standoff. Um, but that doesn't mean that the game should have been allowed to get to this point. This is like in trading card games or something, when players make misplays on turn four, five, or six, and the board state looks totally different on seven or eight, um, and decisions that you made on you know turn four or turn three or something ended up paying off huge by turn seven, turn eight. Um, but you know had like uh, had things just gone. Uh, with higher probability, like let's say that, you know, uh, player B had like 80% chance or 90% chance to draw, you know, 16 different cards or something like that. They didn't draw any of them. And you made decisions that required them to miss all of them um, or for, you know, them to, yeah, just not see those cards. And then it pays off. Um, so right now, T1 are in a commanding uh, commanding state right now with the with these items, but obviously Camille is um, Camille is building Hallbreaker. So we'll talk about Hallbreaker in a second. Hallbre uh, Sterix was actually buffed again. Um, what is Camille doing in these team fights? She's team fighting. Is Camille split pushing to win this game? No. Is Camille ever going to split push to win this game? No. There will always be a team fight at Elder or at Baron that will decide the fate of this game, if not beforehand. That means that the Hallbreaker resists are not super valuable because obviously. Um, uh, 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 call it? Um, wh why am I saying Camille? What the fuck? Nar. Oh my god, Nar, 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 Nar. Um, so, uh, oh my god. Why, why am I saying Camille, man? Camille was the last game. Um, Nar, uh, be, uh fight, uh, he will not win a fight by split push because he can't, right? He just can't outshove any, like, any of the people with teleport on the enemy team. He will not win a fight with split push. He will always jump in. And when he jumps in, Wukong and Galio are jumping in immediately with him. Nar has one of the highest base ADs in the game. Um, uh, Meganar actually has the highest base AD in the entire game, which means that it receives the most benefit from Steric Gage. Steric Gage was also buffed a couple of patches ago, um, and ended up getting more base AD added to it, uh, got buffed by 5% extra base AD. Mininar, I believe, gains access to better damage from Steric at level 11? Uh, or level 12. Um, but currently, the breakpoint for Sterix versus Hallbreaker is at 111 AD, or like 111.2 or 0.3 AD or something like that. Um, Sterix will give more damage than Hallbreaker. So then the argument that you have to make is that the lifeline passive is worth less than um, the resist that you would get from Hallbreaker, um, which I do not think that there was any real logical way that you could ever make that argument with the lifeline passive, given everything that goes on with Nar, as well as Mega Nar, highest base AD inside of the game when he transforms, Plus, he has Trinity Force, which amplifies your base AD, which then means that Sterix gets even more damage. It's just not even close. Um, but he is building uh, Hallbreaker. And now, obviously, uh, stopwatches and stuff are coming in. Um, Guardian Angel is there. Oh, no, we didn't build Hallbreaker. What? I am misremembering. Wow. He does build Sterix. And that's a really good buy for all the reasons that I just said. Um, so that's really good. Okay, that, that's really good. Why did I think he built Hall Was What game was it where he built Hallbreaker? It was some game where he built Hallbreaker. And I can't remember, I can't remember exactly what... Uh, it was. And then this is obviously the last stand. T1 are first to the Elder Faker running in as well. And because they have the low ground and it's not a, a standard fight, they can't death ball. Don Juan can't death ball. They have to run in. Now, when this dragon resets, they also know that Galio is potentially going to come in behind them. Senna gets split up. There's no time for Senna and Heimer to actually poke. Dom Juan makes a very panicked decision to actually just go for the dragon because Faker is shoving in the mid lane. They, I guess they didn't want a repeat of, uh, you know, the KT Dom Juan series. So um, Elder, you know, uh, you know, Azir ends up taking it, but it doesn't matter because they just get squashed. Senna's disconnected. Everyone else inside of the pit just gets completely sat on um, because the, the lead up to the fight is just, it's so unnatural and it's so great for T1. Senna's not here. No time to deal damage. Heimer, zero time to poke. Heimer already has turrets in really bad situations. Everything is just a dream for T1 in this fight. And it's literally like the chef's kiss uh, type of a team fight that just... It, it it the 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 this scenario and how this ends up happening. This looks very good for T1. So that's it. That's it for um 
that's it for the items and the drafts. So this will be on the main channel in the form of a very long video that's going to perform very poorly, and I'm going to cry, and I am now going to go take a break and rest my voice for LCS later, and I'm going to go play World of Warcraft, and I'm going to go be really depressed and sad and question my life and hate everything now. Um, and I'm being dead serious and absolutely sincere with that statement um, because I'm going to feel like everything tonight was completely fucking useless and then I'm going to live every single day knowing that that is the truth because of the actions that others display in front of me and the things that go on inside of the scene and the other types of things that happen and uh, none of this matters and it's just it's just so depressing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll just keep co-streaming and YouTube videos and uh, Patreon and stuff because apparently...